going to go home and come in 10 15 minutes so Uh, okay. So uh, we are live on uh, YouTube now, and uh, so it, it, I mean it's it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to uh, begin our conversation. So uh, this is let me just do a quick round of uh, introductions of the exercise itself. So uh, this is the 12th and actually 13th episode of Lawyers uh, Artists and Others Talk. The point of this series is really for us to reinvent what we know of as bot media. Uh, we are inspired by a love for beauty and a love for wisdom uh, that people can have more of an exposure with, uh, with with aesthetic sensibility and uh, with matters which have some kind of eternal value to them. You know, things which have been true for say hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, before and will be true for hundreds and thousands of years uh, and uh, the aspiration with this is to have a form of public media, uh, not like government-run media or like private media, both of which are sort of um, by interests which are not necessarily visible uh, and therefore sort of affect the kind of um, information we receive. And our aspiration is to always be transparent in which are driving us, you know, uh, and the aspirations which are driving us. So yeah. this series is about, and uh, every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, we feature an artist uh, 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 luminaries, so to say, but luminaries. Signals is cutting. There's a problem with the signals. Sorry. Cutting off, is it? Yeah, signals. It's like I can't hear you sometimes here. Yeah. Uh, is this any better? Are you able to? Oh, yeah. No. no. Okay. I'll, I'll keep going on Kingsley. If there is any issue, then we can uh, reorganize ourselves. Is this okay? Yeah. Now? yeah. Okay. So, in any case, so these, uh, these exercises, episodes are also meant to be. Um, exercises in five so uh, because we thought the cost for transmission is so low that we can actually use this as an opportunity to uh, create a transaction of some sort which is based on transaction virtue uh, the idea is that uh, here right now we are using the first one is social security for migrant workers the second, uh, second one is food security for uh, the urban poor and the third one, uh, the third thing that we're working on is protecting uh, gear for essential workers. So these are the three causes that we are supporting in the in the first month of our existence. As we go along, we have to support different kinds of causes, small businesses, um, support other uh, other people and classes in need of uh, particular assistance, and um, have a public orientation of kindness towards them. So that's what this uh, series is about. Uh, today we have uh, Kingsley, uh, based out of, uh, Kingsley, are you in Colombo today or uh, Candy? I don't know where you're based. I'm in, in Colombo, Colombo now. You're in Colombo. Yes, I have the studio there in Candy. Hmm. Also, I rented here in Colombo. Hmm. It's also a studio again. Yes. <clears throat> this, but it almost seems like you will uh, make a studio out of where you are. <laughs> that is, I don't know if it is very dependent on your uh, location. So yeah. we, we were introduced uh, by Vanna, who's going to join us in about 40-45 uh, minutes or so. Uh, and we were introduced about an hour ago. And I had just 20 hours uh, immersing myself in what to do, how you do what you do, why you do what you do, so on yeah. and so forth. And uh, it's been fascinating to me because like, uh, you work so many kinds of materials. You work yeah. with paint, you work with culture, you work with... I mean, today we're going to spend a lot of time with your book art, uh, yeah. which is a, a, a book for some, some of the curiosity uh, for you. But uh, it, it, it's been fascinating to explore because it sort of reminded me that like being an artist is uh, very common. You know, like being an artist seems to have very little 
to do with uh, the modes that you used to work, you know, and yeah. all people such as myself who who don't have the same kind of uh, artistic capacity or artistic orientations as you might. Uh, fascinating because what I take into my own life from this kind of approach is to be able to look at the world a little more, uh, little more sensitive than uh, we might have otherwise. So uh, that's been that's been pretty uh, fascinating for me personally. So it's a, it's it's a very deep privilege to have you here. You've been uh, now doing shows for much longer than I have been alive, and uh, you've done shows all around. And um, it, it's uh, it, I mean it's really a privilege to have someone with your uh, experience uh, joining us this evening. You know, and I, I'm very 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 grateful to uh, Badna for this, and yeah. I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. So that is uh, that's the situation for now. And uh, we, um, we try to understand um, a little bit about why you do what you do. So can we just start with a few questions about you and then get into your work a little more? Okay. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So can you can you tell me how or what motivated you to? Uh, realize that you were an artist before you were anything else, because you were one of those artists who did a bachelor's degree in in the arts. You know, in India, that's a very rare career choice. Uh, yeah. In the sense that most people don't think you can build a career out of doing that kind of work. Yeah. Uh, so how is it, it that you noticed that you were an artist or wanted to engage artistically with the world? Like I didn't get the, your question, please. I, sometimes it's it's difficult to hear some words. It's cutting and <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I was asking how you noticed that you were an artist. At what point of time was there a moment of time in your life? Uh, was there experience that you had in your life uh, mm -hmm. that you were an artist? Yeah, yeah. It's um, actually it's uh, uh, I like to stay a studio. Mm -hmm. The studio living is my style of art, style of living. So uh, sometimes I I like to cook myself because I'm alone with my studio, and then I cook, and then I do my paintings or my book cards and uh, collective things and. Uh, also so and so and then uh, day to day life the day to day collectives and uh, turn into it's it's when i collect something it's that's the elements to me when when i collect something from that outside or inside in my studio mm. uh, those are the my elements of uh, work so because i i fix it to my uh, especially for my books mm. so then it's sometimes it's purposely and uh, sometimes used with that. Uh, it's it's there. There are some concepts for my art. It's it's sometimes politically, sometimes uh, environmentally, and uh, so and so. Mm. So it's my aim is the uh, interlink of uh, books with different material or uh, disconnect the something mm. that means it's because uh, because i i believe there i believe that there's a bond with the uh, religion science and technology okay what do you mean yeah that means uh, because uh, when when i do the work with that because i i try to uh, absolute the religion as a reflection of uh, nature mm. science as progress wisdom and both of them bond with technology mm. so that means it's it's maybe sometimes i change my mind so <laughs> the nowadays i use of that for mm. especially for my book card Mm. But in when I do my paintings, it's totally different because I am uh, looking for them. Then I'm searching, and uh, I want to explore the minimalism mm. because I use I I I I 
throw and I uh, ignore brushes. Mm. And then I use a spoogy, that means the rubber sheets and the other, the other materials to play with my canvas. Mm. It's maybe sometimes I should have to stay a long time, like uh, maybe one hour, maybe uh, three, two hours in front of my canvas. And then I start, but mm. I need only on the, even a big canvas. Mm. Now I, I know it's, I spent only 30, 40 minutes for that, mm. using that. But I have to prepare maybe one or two or three days. I have to prepare the things like that. Mm. So that's my style now because it's, it's explore. That means uh, uh, it's the minimalism, the minimalistic art. I love that because I have some relationship with Japan and the Japanese art also. Mm. Mm. Actually, the Japanese art means Japanese style of living mm. Mm. and also minimalistic uh, style of art. Mm. So I got that influence from them, mm. Mm. actually. Mm. All over the world, they are the artists also get that type of things. Mm. So that's the style. So I have the two styles because I mainly, except the book art, mm. I do mostly the paintings mm. uh, using that uh, minimalistic style. Okay. So the, okay. So let me just uh, cap understand for myself what you said. So you said in the context of your book, a confluence of religion and technology. Uh, yeah. You have a strong relationship between uh, our relationship with nature and uh, the idea of progress, right? Either yeah. progress as wisdom or progress in uh, in this technocratic uh, kind of terms, you know, which is that yeah. technology has a capacity to liberate us and save us, as does knowledge, you know. So there's a, uh, so that is one bucket of your approach, and the other bucket of your approach is your work with paintings, where you're describing uh, your aspiration for minimalism as coming out of uh, almost as an explosion, you know, in the sense that, like, for instance, if you were to make a bomb, you spend a lot of time putting together the pieces, it explodes all at once. So, in a yeah. certain it reminds me uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, this, this book I like a lot, uh, called Six Memos for the Next Millennium uh, by Italo Calvino. And yeah. he has a chapter called Quickness, and he talks about how, you know, you could work hours and hours assimilating. But the expression of it is very instantaneous. It has, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really work the uh, work in a linear kind of way. You know, in the yeah. it's that with technology, you can say that I have to follow ten steps and find a result. But uh, in other cases, something is happening in ways that we don't necessarily comprehend, and the expression of it is almost spontaneous uh, when it eventually comes out. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how did you get interested in books? Why did you start thinking about, uh, when was the first time you started using books as a form of art? Yeah, um, actually it's a very interesting question because I, I, uh, it's, I can remember the, the 35 years ago, mm. or 40 years ago, uh, it's, there was an incident there in Jaffna. Mm. Because they burned the library, mm. the politicians burned the library. So then that's the that's the point. Because I heard of that, and then I start with the work of uh, uh, books as mm. an art. Mm. You know the the uh, it merely break the laws of art, the visual reading under the new dimension. No? Mm. The book mm. art is not reading of the book, but a transform into a sculpture. Mm. Okay, you know that. No, it is a work of art. Mm. Book art is a really uh, uh, intimacy and attractive new medium of art, but it's very powerful. Which when the and, and now as an artist, he or she should use that book as a message using as a message because it's very easy 
it's it's i think it's not only the artist if someone has some imaginative power in your mind you also can do that it's mm. it's you can use the books as an art object mm. you can express them with the using with the something it's you can add something you can throw and you can burn you can uh, spare and your tie and everything you can add something also because i add sometimes the uh, the, the the small uh, toy soldiers on the books sometimes mm. i use the empty bullets it's 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 not the real bullets but it's a, it's a look like bullet if you see there it's you can see it's bullets oh we use bullets it's there's a meaning yeah there's yeah. meaning and there's a very deep meaning when you go through with that the material material is the language of uh things of that kind of art mm -hmm. so you know actually this is a i, I was uh, i thought we can jump right into your uh, work so i i was actually i had opened the i'll show you what i opened and uh, you'll see why obviously it is really so we were just on this uh, on this piece because we were yeah. just now we were talking about uh, what it means it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a amazing story in, in behind of that book uh, you I, know it's because when i it's it, because i want to i like to say that story very very quickly because yeah. when i when i go there because the early i use that uh, blade uh, for my books the some blades and knife i mm. use for making the shape of the bullet mm. early the early works but mm. nowadays we have the technology so then i went to the shop and i asked them to do that uh, for this design of bullet shapes and then i gave them and then finally when i when they are to collect the books the CID and the uh, intelligence services and the police, everybody, so many people arrested me for this. <laughs> It's the funny thing, you so, know, in public. Uh, how do I do that? Because if 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 I am a, the bad person for use for that the bullets, uh, I'm going to to do the in public. No, that's that's the point. But they they are not. going to think deeply and then arrested me and they asked question i think 9 hours i have to stay with them and i fighting with them and i had to <laughs> and, and i had to uh, teach them what is book art mm. how, how do you use the book for uh, some expressions so uh, can you tell us about this piece we'll start with this piece because i was yeah. trying to understand uh, what you were doing you know? yeah because it's 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 the the shape of the bullets mm -hmm. the whole shape of the bullets but the bullets still uh, made by charcoal charcoal okay mm -hmm. that means burn burn one it's a, maybe burn wood maybe burn the uh, contact charcoal i use the charcoal for that uh, shapes mm -hmm. for the book mm -hmm. so it means i think you you then then you can then you when you go through that kind of materials because mm -hmm. materials are telling something to the viewer yes also the uh, the, the 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 all the materials like uh, charcoal it's now you can use only for only for drawing maybe only mm. for drawing so then it's the other hidden meaning because they are the they are one side empty the other side full of charcoal bullets hmm. but the bullets if if someone if if someone means if if any person or artist can use for that shape of bullets for his drawing or her drawing that's oh. all Oh, how so how did you select this book did you have a reason why you selected world without end life and the will of the father I never heard of what is this book wait yeah talk? because it's that is it's amazing also when i go to go through there in that the old book sellers mm. 
I I have to stay maybe one day, two days, three days. I am going there, and though I I anyhow I then I can find the kind of that uh, uh, text and also the uh, this kind of books that uh, title book. So then it's it's very suited for the my work. <laughs> okay. It's it's it's, it's happened. I don't know what. But... Okay. because you know i think we'll understand more about your artistic choices when we see different kinds of sculptures and art you've done with books so yeah. let's move to another one let's move yeah, uh, yeah. i'm just okay why don't we move to this uh, I, it's 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 because uh, you know the nowadays the people who live in sri lanka i don't know the other countries hmm. anyway they ignore the they ignore the, uh, uh, the 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 studying of that uh, uh, like sahitya uh, can uh, it so the not deeply not deeply thinking about the uh, uh, education mm. so the books means the educate people for that mm. so that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a um, kind of material mm. for the educator or maybe they to study for something like that so that's why i put that oh, that's so, uh, one two three four five six seven books of uh, shakespeare's you know oh. it's shakespeare's book the small books i found the same place that the the, the old booksellers place And so, uh, yeah, it, it's and then I it's it's now 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 you can see it's look like pieces of cakes. Yeah, literature. It's the literature, the literature book. It's Othello, <laughs> the part by part Othello books. Ah, uh. put I covered with the the cake board and then I use for that because it's a sarcastic. idea you're right and uh, I, i can see that it's a sarcastic idea because when i looked at it things kingsley the first thing i noticed is that you had presented it as rich and sugary you know it's, yeah. it's not something that uh, someone studies for wisdom but you you consume because you are addicted to sugar for instance you know yeah. it for the bite size yeah and i noticed that and the second thing i noticed is that you presented it within this form which we usually see in uh, very fancy dinners you know you see it yeah. in the house um you know, very, i mean extremely rich for um uh, uh, while serving food so i found it fascinating to think that uh, at once the that we had access to the books that we had access to was yeah. So, I mean, predominantly the domain of people who are from a very upper class, yeah. and second, printed in a form which is easily con- consumable. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, when I look at this, I'm not thinking of Shakespeare. I'm thinking yeah. this is something sweet uh, and something fancy. You know. Yeah, because it's when it's it's a it's a sculpture that the, the, that is because when you go through uh, around the work. and mm. then you can see when you close to the uh, work you mm. can see the shakespeare there in the spine that you know that's also interesting because then there's another dimension to it which is yeah. if you do notice what you're consuming you can yeah. find richness in any case you don't have to, uh, you don't have to wait for uh, this to be made visible to you explicitly in a dry form it can also come within this kind of context you know where it's sweet and easy to consume and yeah. you can still get into wisdom you can still get into uh, trying to appreciate the beauty of it beyond the packaging of the knowledge itself yeah this uh, no okay go to another piece now uh, okay so this is interesting because now we are moving across media so you want to talk about both the uh, uh what I, i mean i'd love to hear what you have to say about this i is very very simple very simple because it's look like a very abstract form of 
painting mm. but if you can see when you close because it's sometimes if uh, this type of works you mm. should have to go close and then you can see that the books burn books are there mm. the uh, collective burn books and uh, you can see the underneath there is a cross where the my here down down the corner of the painting Oh yeah, hmm. yeah. It's a cross. Cross means the election, the oh. symbol of the election. I see. Okay. So then they 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 fight. They they burn the library and they burn that kind of uh, the very uh, treasures to for the people's things. Mm. Uh, purpose is their election. That's all. It, it's very simple the simply i want to say that in the underneath there is a there is a cross there's oh that's so interesting because you know i was actually wondering i saw an earlier painting where uh, again we you, you were playing with crosses right was is this also meant to evoke the election symbol yes it's a symbol of uh, elections because i think it's other side is uh, the political uh, something uh, i cannot remember the text uh, uh, But that uh, title that's it's a book uh, book of uh, book of uh, politics it's single i think yes so yeah. then all the cross 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 because the people are they 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 the politicians you they they can't see now the we are you are pe- we are people uh. we are cross you are the 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 for for their they we are live for their election so <laughs> what you have to vote you have to vote us vote 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 everything they because they have the only their mind is the vote the vote symbol you know it, the it's the actually of the books it's it's funny that you put it on top of a book on politics because yeah. uh, much like the other idea this uh, the second painting that we saw there's yeah uh, in both cases you are evoking uh, the discussion of knowledge Production of art for the sake of politics, uh, right? For the sake of uh, political decision making, or yeah, making opinion in a certain way or the other, which is convenient to you. So it's uh, it's interesting to see the same message book once again. Uh, yes. This now uh, I want. Okay, what what started happening here? Oh yeah, this is the one which is very related with that bullet books because it's huh. because they they. Ask me to. Uh, they they took photos of my front, my sides, my other sides, and the size, and they measured the things and everything because it's like a terrace. They mm. took photos of mine. So then that is that's me. That's my portrait. It's my the that is my profile when I turn like that and ah. in the front and also the, it's 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 a funny thing for me. It's. it's not the funny because it's uh, it's uh, sometimes it's very bad for my uh, because at, at that month mm. i spend it's the frustrated because it's it's not easy to live with here in because i am alone and what is going to do there and the, the things because it's me and inside in also the me uh, there that's the that's the book oh that's, that's it. the portrait book it's it's related with that uh, this the uh, incident incident no yeah, so when you it's re, did you make it as part of the same series or was it part of a different uh, series sorry was it part of the same series did it come in the same like no, no it's uh, two three books only so that for the series okay and so in this uh, like um, you were capturing your experience as an artist who was under attack by representing your profile picture you have depicted a bullet here uh through your persona in the other picture yeah okay one second i'm just going to go back to that so we can see that once again yeah uh how did you how did you make these uh, cuts did you use like a laser printer or something a laser print laser print it's a laser cut it's a laser cut the same place <laughs> you know there's some people they they to that uh, to the uh, ask then the police and he is going to cut that and this so at the that moment also then that's why i i i used that 
for the laser cut for the inside me and also the me and me, the myself. Why have you? Uh, what have you written on top of this? On top of this, it's uh, now I cannot remember that text and but the sizes I mentioned. The, my high, the height of that dimensions, so right? My shoulder size and the head size and every sizes because they measured that no, for the terrorist when you <laughs> arrested, they do that. Yeah, but why? Wh what is so threatening about um, about your art? Why was it so dangerous that you needed to be arrested? Uh, because of the shape of the bullets. They asked. They they told me at. When it's it's very dangerous because you make the whole of that uh, bullet shapes. Mm. Yeah, it can be put into the uh, some kind of uh, size. They said uh, the bullets also you can they can hide. Someone can hide it and then someone use for the uh, kill for someone. They said. I yeah. said it's 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 a, it's a it's a it's a silly thing because it's. How do you do that? Because it's it's a very old kind of uh, CID, like uh, not the James Bond style, but also the very old. <laughs> so that style. <laughs> okay, CID. That's yeah. not a charitable comparison at all. This yeah. uh, I found this very interesting. You like this? You've taken yeah. <clears throat> it's it's cause. you know it's uh, health no. Mm -hmm. The Book of Health, it's a Red Cross also, that is a cover with just a bandage, just a bandage. It's, they thought it's, that is more than enough. It's, the, it's not the perfect health for the people, for the, for the, for the, the, the people in, in, in Sri Lanka, mostly, because it's not enough that period of that uh, kind of uh, health. So just the bandage, not the medicine. So that's why I use the red and the red cross also inside. When you close to the book, you mm -hmm. can see the red cross, the shape of the cross. Also, I cut cut it down. And this cover it's did... the situation of the health is ah. not good because when you come in Sri Lanka. You mm. can see the hotels type of uh, luxury type of uh, 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 hospitals. Mm. Those are not hospitals. It's look like look like uh, hotels. So they <laughs> use that. So the it's the business. Right. So mm. the, the the Red Cross and the health is, I think, the government side. It's mm. they use only the bandage. <laughs> this is true for all of modern medicine, right? Like uh, we end up, we are not. I, I've actually thought about this a lot, and I keep thinking that in in the maintaining of health, you are only trying to uh, repair your body. You are not trying to amplify your health. Uh, but now, when you think about health and wellness, wellness has also gotten commoditized. Uh, yeah. Very similar to that uh, uh, to that earlier image that you had, which had to be presented in easily consumable yeah. bite sizes if you wanted to enjoy it, right? Yeah, because it's because it's uh, the the people thought it's uh, think like that because it's uh, now we are developed because we have the very good beautiful hospitals are there, many mm. many hospitals are there. Mm. So that's the thing. That's first, no? Because it's that means. The health is bad. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think about your uh, health? What do you think about your own health? How do you, uh, do you, do you have a philosophy of health? Do you um, choose when you want to visit a hospital, when you don't want to visit? Do you follow certain dietary patterns uh, to care for your health? How do you think about it? Because it's a, my, the, my thing is, it's a, you should have to start with the, the lifestyle. Hmm. The, you should have to realize your lifestyle first and lifestyles and also the, you have to uh, the consume items even uh, like uh, like food especially hmm. then I think that I love that India because it's the, you have the very good style of uh, food style in India and also the Japan 
but mm. in sri lanka we used mostly the people and the the children the parents uh, they pushed them to eat some uh, instant food mm. Mm. i think 89% is it's it's worst it's because it's it's very bad food here mm. in sri lanka i think food is the first and we should have to grow yeah yourself yeah and in in this period of that uh, lockdown period is uh. very important to think and it's it's the turning point i think if you think like that mm. you can realize yeah i think so i mean i think it's like uh, this we are seeing that right now right now <laughs> to another type of this what yeah i see many types and i was thinking okay why would you ever put a security check tag on a yeah. check 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 everywhere it's checking 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 and it's a early book but also the checking it's just a label and the they thought it's already checked mm. so it's a it's look like a fashion it's <laughs> that's why i use that the check can check can checked uh-huh. so everywhere check uh-huh. already check so then when i go through there in the the airport or somewhere there they said check it's it's because i'm i'm thinking about the, the 1000 or 500 years ago yeah what happened in the world mm. there is was there in this type of checking or something like that the people there are people are not honest so that's the thing mm. check is the label of the thinking of pattern so <laughs> <laughs> this because it looks like a fashion label on uh, yeah it also looks like your uh, this is now approved for consumption you know like yeah. if you don't do this much because i noticed you picked an encyclopedia for this yeah you didn't pick any book you picked a, a book of books you book a picked a book of uh, vast knowledge so yeah when you put an encyclopedia and then put these security check marks on top of that it's essentially saying this is the library of acceptable knowledge that you can acquire in your life uh, yeah. which is a which is a very funny idea you know yeah. you know when i'm encountering your work kingsley i'm just uh, like i'm not sure when to feel really sad and when to just start it uh, i feel like so much of it is uh, ironic you know it doesn't feel like you're taking yourself uh, very seriously but also very lightly simultaneously like yeah. it's one one yeah. i ah, this is very, a... very this is there's some story in, in behind also that it, it's uh, it's called the single english you know dictionary you know? so mm. then uh, there it's it's curtailment the mm. curtailment of education rights mm. and rights and it's also the it's, it's also the violence oh. because it's uh, they they block the education the system of the education they block to block the uh, the, uh, the students to go to school or go to a uh, 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 university or also there are a lot of barriers mm. so the curtailment of educational rights so that's why i covered with you. you can't read that because it's a jail now oh my god it's a jail it's it's the some period not the not the, uh, uh, some kind of period that kind of uh, i think i cannot remember the years but there are so many struggles in the universities and the education system and all the, the politicians they have been, had some fight with them so that and that period i put into that book for jail because it's uh, it's it's single english dictionary that means uh, they they block the block to learn for the other people the other language like it's 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 that's the thing i i have a question kingsley so yeah I can't. I can't hear you. No, no, no. Did you 
uh, particularly pick a sinhala and english book yeah it was like a sinhala and tamil dictionary the uh, the question i want to ask you is yeah. do you see the jailing as not allowing people to mix with or do you see the jailing as a fault of progress mm. like certain way english is thought of as the language of progress uh, yeah. i think in south asia right yeah. now in our time in this era we are questioning whether that's true uh yeah. we need to know english if we want to do good work whether yeah. it's relevant for us to speak the same kind of english as the next person actually very important question because i already already uh, bought the book of uh, singhala and tamil for using the same thing oh no, very my second version that's my second version thank you very much for the remember that because it's i bought uh, there in the uh, the bookshop uh, i think before the corona uh, virus uh, incident period so then i bought that book but it's it's stop that it's because of lockdown no? so that's why i didn't do that uh, with book i uh, already done with that i bought that the tamil and uh, singhala dictionary also but the idea is very very interesting it's very evocative yes okay. thank you no, no what is happening here because first uh, i was sure if i was looking at burnt toast <laughs> then i realized that there are some glasses on top Uh, yeah that is the problem of the ethnic uh, problem there in sri lanka once they we uh, they burst the, the 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 bomb blast behind that the churches and the hotels and all uh, so uh, and after that uh, incident the people the some religious people and uh, 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 they violated with that they, they burned some houses of uh, muslims especially and also at only that i think because when you go in uh, top of the book i mm. uh, i i wrote that uh, the date and the year also the uh, the incident we can see that because the the yeah it's it's it it someone wants to read it they can read with the year and the date and the month of the What? incident what did you what were you thinking about when you placed these glasses on why did you what were you trying to represent because i mean if you didn't tell me that this is based on ethnic conflict i would never have yeah. guessed it had anything to do yeah yeah because it's uh, so if someone want to go through that year and the date and the month it's it's you can think you shouldn't have to think because it's this kind of art it's very 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 difficult to say the direct but it sometimes it's we are going to say the indirect also because it's yeah. uh, you know the, the this is the incident of not only the book and the other goods also the the consumer items like the 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 glass the uh, reading glass it's using for read the books they <laughs> they attack the uh, things like that Hmm. so uh, because you know this one is also they like, found from the somewhere there outside of my house <laughs> no now definitely we say because that's a thing because i am uh, collecting things like uh, some materials raw materials i uh, don't know what will happen but i want to collect i have the it's a, it's a, like a collective things so many 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 of collective things i have because sometimes it's picks with the art book mm. especially that's uh, it's beautiful you know i actually wouldn't have noticed immediately that these are reading glasses the yeah. point these uh, so not only are you burning your materials in the first place you're also burning the means to consume the materials yes <laughs> destroying someone's capacity to perceive and the thing which the which someone is trying to perceive so yeah. it's like a more complete destruction than uh, one might have noticed you know yes uh, actually it's so it's so nice to have you speak of this long side uh entry uh I, i i think most of us we don't have the the slowness in our lives to be able to enjoy this so to yeah. be able to notice it and to enjoy what it means and how we think about it so, yeah thank you thank you so much for like coming i'm going to yeah then also the, the finally i want to say the hopefully 
Uh-huh. This will not happen again. So that's my slogan. Right. Hopefully this yeah. will. Happen again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope for that. Now, uh, I want to move to another kind of thing. What is what is happening here? This is. Yeah. <laughs> this is off. Yeah. It's it's also the two kind of uh, soldiers like. Sri Lanka government army and LTT. You can see that when you go through that, uh, the very close to the uh, uh, soldier, it's uh, camouflage. Mm-hmm. That's the thing because it's we are fighting for the the same land. We are living in a in a one land and we are fighting for the land. It's it's not the, not in the only the for the land but the the two rights. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it's a question is why do we making some war type of things up? Why don't we discuss and to uh, do we can do another way of this? Because you can that uh, you can see that uh, the constitution in Sri Lanka, mm-hmm. uh, I it, it's a it's a culture book. It is remember that book. It's a culture book it's about the culture. So oh. then I. I I put into that uh, kind of uh, text. It's called the 1972. Mm. They changed the constitution. Right. So that in that constitution is the dangerous thing because it's they make something uh, spoil the people who live in the Tamils and Sinhalese. They separate into that constitution. Isn't the 1972 constitution when uh, two ideas came up? One was the notion of federalism, and one was the notion of uh, Buddhist primacy in the constitution. The primacy of Buddhism as an uh, idea in the constitution was that did, did that happen in 1972? Yes, I think I can remember that because I got that some kind of I wrote, wrote that book and also they. That constitution, anyhow, they 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 spoil the things and all. Mm. So that's the thing. So that's why I put in and I write on that constitution on the that text, that the cultural text. Wonderful. It's called the the title of the uh, the book is War Text. Is called War Text. War Text. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny. Uh, let me go on to a little more. So I think we have time for one or two more pieces. So let's I will pick something. Okay. Yes. Before we, yeah. we have oh these are nicer shots of the, the these are the charcoal bullets. No, it's I love how smooth. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> What was happening here? Yeah, this is it's very personal thing because it's it's a uh, concepts of my masters uh-huh. because uh, there's another kind of uh, I think culture or something like that very close to the art or art form book and then my master said something that's uh, it's his uh, his quotes mm. I use for that book on mm. the on that uh, the the text and then I fix it with nails. Hmm. Hmm. You can throw it out and then I fix with the nails. It's very personal. It's, uh, can I ask you what he said? The, he said it's it's uh, because it's he said a lot of things like, uh, like uh, he said art means uh, purity of heart. Hmm. That's his quote. And hmm. also there is no must in art because art is free and also the when you swear, if uh, if he, he is a time to time he is now 89 eight, 8 years old which mm. he is mm. my master of uh, that uh, my my lovely master he is an abstract artist also mm. um, he when I go uh, to see him, and then I, we had some discussion with that about art, and I had to write. Sometimes I had to record them, and then I put into that 
quote mm. on that book. Very it's nice. It's very strong. It's he said it's very simple because he has some uh, because he has some experience with eleven uh, years uh, spent there in that uh, Japan, mm. and he married the Japanese lady also. Mm. His lifestyle also very uh, very simple. is a very simple person i learned from him how to use the raw material for mm. you are mm. you know when i saw this i actually thought that you were murdering the name you were trying to put onto the on on onto the book <laughs> it looks much more violent than uh, even the book piece for instance you know i'm looking at it the first thing it evokes in me is that Oh man, that looks like some real damage has been done. <laughs> But uh, being nailed into something, yeah. like mm. it's it's at that so and also the because because of the nails you can't read properly. But when when someone wants to investigate with that it, then you can go through the text, the the black text. Right. Yeah, the brush text. It's using for the brush. So okay. then. then uh, it's it, it's not easy to read but mm. that's the thing because i want to i want to show that because it's not easy so mm. that's why i fix with the nails mm. 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 oh that uh, that's very interesting so i will even uh, whether you want to fix the knowledge in your head or the fact you need to go through a process which is as intense as this to be able to uh, assimilate what it stands for Uh, in that sense i suppose it's a it it does reflect a lot of pain uh, yeah yeah it's it's it's, 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 it's very, and also it's very painful it is it, we, yeah because it's it's not easy to uh, reach everyone it's it's very difficult to reach to that stage so mm. that's why he, i cannot remember the whole text but it's that's the that's the meaning of that hmm so that's why i don't you can't remove that because i fix with the nails <laughs> you know, this i think this is okay we have time for one more okay let me go to a id <coughs> okay you want to talk to us about these cultures what is happening here this you know um this is obviously quite tall right and yeah. put it uh, this is inter- this is your doing you know the yeah. fact yeah yeah <laughs> we're thinking we're going through i i i mean of course i would tell you and then also tell you what what i thought when i first saw this yeah it's this one also the the uh, the incident of that uh, the the library the the symbol of things because the people thought that just a library born, burn library means that the, the most of people uh, think like that because are uh, just a library you know not only the library the knowledge mm. they burn knowledge of the people the the the, the, the it's a treasure mm. so that's why i want to show again that with the, with the four wheels of the trolley put on to the book uh, books and the, all the face books and the uh, things i bought from that uh, uh, old books uh, shop and they are going to recycle some some books mm. so then i asked them to please give me that the recycled books and they asked very few money for that and then i use for that and then you can see the burn in the up on top but not below the top of that yeah, yeah. the totally burn the, the top and then but if someone wants to use the others in the downs they are in that the knowledge they can yeah then they, you have to remove the the burn book so, and then you can use that books the the underneath and why did you add this trolley what were you conveying the trolley means the it's it's goes the, it's go around it's a wheel wheel means you can you have to go around mm. so there is a certain idea of uh, being able to share and progress yeah. in the, some collective endeavor which is born out of uh, your encounter 
it's mm. this is uh, this is really lovely okay last last i mean i've said this mm. it's like, yeah it's a, it's a book of democracy no <laughs> how do you how do you read it it's you can't read because they throw it out at the there are no keys no <laughs> you can't yeah you have to you have to cut the logs and then pad logs and then it's, it's not easy because it's you already already damage the democracy so no. there there's many 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 <clears throat> many kind of uh uh, uh padlocks many kinds also, of conditions for yeah, padlocks the padlocks uh, maybe the next version maybe the, the padlocks it has some names uh uh-huh. <laughs> the other version yes is uh, no it's a really beautiful piece so because when i when i first saw this i thought that the way i mean you're saying throw away the key but when i saw this i thought the forms of democracy conditions sorry the forms of democracy that we see in our society has so many preconditions like yeah. more often than not you only talk about how you are unfree you don't talk yeah. about it enables freedom you know yeah yeah when i saw this i thought okay the book of democracy is a book of it's not a book of liberation you know yes book which is open but it's closed and it's also conditional and yes. uh, the idea that uh, democracy would be would have been yeah. ready this is very unfair yeah. you when you go through that books because when you turn the first page you can see mm. the, the sri lanka mm. uh, election uh from 1930s i can remember that mm-hmm. uh 30s i think they started that uh, many 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 elections are there so then i write it down the the dates and years and the dates of that election periods of sri lanka it's the history right the democracy is that <laughs> no democracy in 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 72 years <laughs> cuz that so this is so this is the story of undemocracy as opposed to democracy yeah. this, yes. uh, this case so i think this is a, this is a very interesting point for us to uh, sort of bring the fir- uh, uh, the first portion of our conversation to a close and yeah. um, i just want to thank you so much for joining joining us today and uh, Barna and Karun also sir. I'm going to ask to unmute them. Yeah, the all the works I think uh, five years ago I think all the works. Yeah, five or oh, four years ago I have done those books. Yeah. So uh, what is your latest project? The latest is also the Red Cross. Oh yeah, the health one. yeah the no the latest is not there it's it's still with me now <laughs> that is all the books are old old uh, fashion and the, the the early governments and they also so hopefully this will not happen again so that's my i i ask again and again <laughs> yeah that is our hope as well. so uh, thank you so much for joining us it was uh, really i mean like for me personally it, it's been a wonderful change of pace because uh, you know i, I feel like we live in a generation where we consume knowledge very mindlessly almost you know so we don't like we don't spend time looking at books as artifacts uh, as objects of knowledge and evolution and those kind of ideas so uh, it was wonderful to encounter them uh, afresh through you so thank you so much for joining us and varna who has joined us thank you so much varna for uh, uh, yeah very difficult kind of uh, we haven't had a session of this sort before and i don't think we'll have a session of this sort uh, in the future i hope we have more sessions like this because there's a there's a pace and thoughtfulness to it which we don't uh, uh, encounter in in our daily life yeah So, uh, okay. okay thank you but it's very quickly i prepared for the, the things like that to you and because i tried to send that uh, early but it's it's 
uh, the photographer is not using for that. So that's why I think too heavy. So that's why I sent them uh, for that for the four times. Okay, okay. It doesn't matter. It's not so much about the the work that we cover as much as the depth. You know. In fact, I would have actually preferred that we did only one one work of art for one whole hour. Yeah. Yeah, it was really nice because nobody else is so. <laughs> so we'll move to the second part of the conversation. Can you, my uh, suggestion to you is you can feel free to uh, leave now. If you want to stay and participate in the conversation, we would love to have you over. Uh, the second part of our conversation today is on uh, about justice, right? I I think this whether what kind of choices. uh architects and those who construct the world around us uh, me uh, with the intention of amplifying what they think of as just right uh, so we have three uh, very renowned uh, architects at very different stages in their uh, career uh, so it's not clear at all badri yeah 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 not yeah, not yeah run able to hear you please oh is it i am is yeah. Am I inaudible or is it uh, is it going on and off? Yeah, this is scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold up, let me see. I'm just going to try. One moment. The things that we have to do for Zoom. <laughs> nice. You know, this is what we use every day. You know. Oh, as though technology is the most predictable thing ever, but I don't know of a more uh, object in our day-to-day -day life than Wi-Fi connections. Badri, you still there? I think he's going off to loop. Yeah. <laughs> hi, Karun. Hi, Varna. Yeah. Hi, Vijay. Hi, Kings. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Hi, guys. Hello, hi. That was lovely. I just caught the last bit of your presentation, Kingsley, with the the book of democracy. I was really oh, yes. poignant. Yeah. And also, <laughs> Badri is reading of it, which was a little different from probably your intention. that the book itself yeah. is compromised because of the locks you know <laughs> which is in this yes. uh, it's very very okay. nice. uh yeah. so but you still off I'm still off i don't know what is happening i'm that? using exactly the same settings as we used thrice a week <laughs> so this is it's fine now yeah one number or gear yeah it's okay it's okay okay fine so uh, let let's begin because uh, yeah in, in in the interest of uh, time and what not so this is the 12th uh, slash 13th episode of lawyers artists and others talk law lab uh, the aspiration of this series is to uh, reinvent what we know of as broadcast media uh, we want to create a version of media which is inspired by love for beauty and love for wisdom you know we think that we don't get to uh, experience sensuality often enough in our day to day existence and the other point is that we don't get to engage in eternal questions you know like more often than not in conversations you're saying don't be too philosophical uh, don't ask these big big questions right now you just have to do a small thing but we are waging a war against uh, the smallness of imagination so uh, the aspiration here is to ask uh, as big questions as we can manage um to so that so as to fit within the format nevertheless uh this this series is also meant to be a series of fundraisers uh, we're trying to create a version of public media which is not anchored a uh, weight down by invisible interests right so the these are specifically fundraisers for um social security for migrant workers food security for the urban poor and the protective gear for essential care givers because we think these are the three top priorities in terms of um trying to in the social effects of the virus outside of building the medical uh, technology that's necessary so tonight's conversation the second segment of tonight's conversation is a matter of how we think about um 
increasing the amount of justice in the world through architectural choices through choices that one makes within the built environment right so we have uh, yeah so we have uh, we have vijay vijay ramachandran who runs uh, 100 hands uh, we have varna and we have tarun kumira and uh, they are very renowned architects very good at what they do uh, but more than that the reason why i particularly felt the need to invite them to this conversation was because they're very gentle and thoughtful human beings uh, in ways that uh, often i am not so i have learned a lot from them and i feel like there's a lot that a lot of us can uh, sort of understand from 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 the three of us uh, from three of them uh, here so um usually we start off with one question which is common to all panelists and we'll start with that now as well uh, we have the next one and a half hours to talk about what you do so the first question that i want to ask all of you is uh, how to talk about yourself without talking about what you do or where you're from right so please introduce yourself don't uh, don't tell us what you do we know what you do uh, don't tell us where you're from we know you're from bangalore at least for the sake of this contemporary movement uh and uh, yeah karun we'll start with you how do you mm-hmm. think about it? yeah i mean it has to be see you know all three of you are giving me like restrained looks totally <laughs> <laughs> i don't know totally a matter of who is going to be least offended by the question you know okay, <laughs> okay repeat the question please i said how do you talk about yourself without talking about what you do or where you're from i i just like to be somebody who can make who could participate in a difference karun and prasajan yeah what else <laughs> i was about to say this is an answer for miss, miss universe you know you <laughs> 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 have to say what is that karun ah uh, Who doesn't want to participate? Who will say I don't want to participate in making a difference? Why will I say I don't want to participate in making a difference? Let it be sufficiently distinctive so we can identify yeah, you see, as. See, like like you say, uh, said earlier, I overheard you. Uh, this consumeristic school of thought has told us uh, or conditioned us rather to tell uh, to present ourselves with just with I in the question. what i meant to say like the mr was to say <laughs> is like let's see what's happening around and i like to be inclusive rather than exclusive mm-hmm. and i think we spoken about that further i can go on for hours about being about being inclusive and exclusive how our society has been is all about exclusivity you know and we could talk about design we could talk about Our social classes in any any kind of a strata we just talking mm. about uh, how do you say we we we're talking about uh, j- just layers of society social cultural social economic etc etc and then we, we we just say like that's where you come from you know uh but at the same time when i look at this whole thing I think I come from a uh, funny kind of uh, situation where I'm more of a nomad. That's what I've been perceived to be. But I've been grounded in Bangalore for a long time. But I'm quite a nomad in a certain way. But, but the thing is, just to uh, clue myself into the my place of birth, that is my hometown, is quite difficult. I could, I could also it also the thing is uh, one has to be very politically correct mm-hmm. I, i was just uh, wondering why why can't we as architects have a open source between us no? mm-hmm. you, you, you just share what you thought about no? if somebody mm-hmm. is going to pursue the idea somewhere else it's fine no? it's good and then as long as it's participatory it's fine yeah so if you want to put me back on track it's i will, i will put you back this is let's see i don't think i've ever been trusted to put anything back on track in my life, but this conversation can always be the first opportunity to do that 
So, Karun, what I took from you is that you're interested in the disappearance of the eye and uh, and the existence, which is which seems to be uh, focused around sharing and uh, notion of like being universal in your imagination and your action as well. So, uh, it's a nice answer of you to say. It's nice of you to say that you associate with that aspiration, you know, a, a common aspiration towards humanity. Uh, Bijoy, what about you? How would you talk about yes without talking about what you do? And uh, well, you've you've stumped me a bit because I, unfortunately, uh, and and many people have made fun of it because even even when I'm not in the office, I'm reading about architects or spending time with architects, and it defines so much of who I am. So when you ask me, like, do do I uh, do anything else? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, well, I, I maybe I'll take a leaf out of what Karun is saying, and I think that uh, I'm I'm interested in in fairness, if that's a general sort of way to be. That uh, in in a in a project or when you're dealing with other people, to be conscious of you know what the other people are saying and how they're engaging with you. So that kind of uh, an equilibrium. On, and on projects, it's very difficult sometimes to see eye to eye on things and to always be striving for a sense of a shared authorship of things. I think that's that's what I, I hope that we can do with, with the work that we do, not only in architecture, but in anything else. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, if I were to rephrase the question, would you say fairness is what you wake up in the morning and get to sleep at night? Because... I mean, like, how is it? How is it associated with your identity? I mean, the rest of today's conversation is going to be about fairness and justice and all these ideas. But, um, what is well, it? Uh, so when when you get out of architecture school, in architecture school, by and large, the education kind of trains you to think of the I, like Karun is saying. You know that it is it is the the great master with the great ideas, and you know you come out then very quickly. I think almost every architect who graduates and starts working in the field understands that you are a very small you know part of a much larger sort of entity that is then making buildings or making architecture mm. and i think a lot of people fight that through their careers this inability to really have that kind of khan like presence or corbusier like presence and they they're frustrated by that you know inability to make those heroic sort of things but I think the, the most successful architects accept that, that this is a negotiated result. And so as an architect, I think, and, and then as a human being, I think architecture brings to bear very quickly this sort of huge, uh, you know, the, the teamwork that's involved in making things, you know, the collaboration. Of course, now there's other, other sort of dimensions to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Teamwork in the old days before the pandemic was the client. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the the consultants. You know maybe the main contractor, and now mm -hmm. in this new world, we are seeing all of those other invisible people who you know we didn't even notice who are actually doing a lot of the work on sites. And so, I think fairness would be a good way to describe it. That at least that's the aspiration that you find a way to make things that then are uh, are equitable. That there, there is some notion of at least you're conscious of what the inequities are, at least to start mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a very beautiful answer. I mean, I will say something about this after uh, Varun's answer to this, but like uh, in some synoptic sense, at least I think that's um, that unifies the three of your approaches in your work from what I've encountered of it. You know, in a certain way, I've always felt like your style is very gentle. None of you seem to try to impose yourself on the uh, viewer or the person who is uh, encountering your work. Uh, it seems it seems to create space for the person to be able to uh, be more of themselves, to encounter things a little more gently. You know, it, it, it's not jarring. It's not it's not standing out in a uh, in a way that might be um, I don't want to say offensive to the senses, but it's not trying to capture your attention. You know, in, and monopolize your attention. It, it doesn't speak that language. So it's interesting that you make that point, and I suppose that's something that runs through all through um, everything I've encountered. Uh, of your work, actually. So, thanks for a wonderful answer uh, to that. Varna, what about you? I came to you last because you have expressed hesitation in, <laughs> in asking and answering these kind of questions before. I hope this is enough time and notice to malapay better. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Badri, and thanks for inviting me um, today. Um, I think I think I share the same kind of um, uh, hesitation as Bijoy, and perhaps my answer is not as profound. I think it's very difficult to separate me from what I do because essentially what I do is not really work. I think it it sort of combines all my interests, everything related to design, art history, literature, environment, travel. So I think it all intersects at landscape. So, um, so it's very, uh, and you know, that's, that's personally what I feel is like an extension of what I do. So um, it's very difficult to separate that, mm -hmm. but basically these are some of the things that I am interested in. That, you know, why that's a lovely answer. That's a really lovely answer because it's to say, that your work is the uh, is the thing that unifies all aspects of your being. Uh, and your aspects of being span all these different dimensions, and your work happens to assimilate it very nicely. So that's when I think about all of you, it feels like you couldn't be doing anything besides what you're doing right now. Almost, you know, uh, all of you are fairly obsessive workaholics, but the work seems to be an extension of a way of living as opposed to something that you take out time to do, you know, like not, not something that uh, you do because uh, you're but getting paid. I beg, beg to differ, what is work when you love your, when you oh, love yeah. your work and you love your life? Yeah. What do you mean? What's the line between your work and your life? Otherwise, I have given up architecture long ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm laughing because I can't cry publicly. So I suppose uh, that's that's the only yeah, thing. And, uh, it's, it's more of a, if you look at it in the negative sense, it's more mm. of an addiction or an ailment that you <laughs> live with. It's a condition. <laughs> a condition, yeah. I agree with you, Vijay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the thing is, when you ask binary questions, yeah. It, it, it's, it's very difficult to say this is how it is without, yeah? Because when you look at it, I, I have architecture, which I love. I have my family, which I love a lot. And I, and I love uh, the piece of earth or the globe that we stand on. And, and coming from a profession that pollutes the most, I'm, I'm a worried man. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, you like it or not, architecture pollutes, uh, not as architects at the end product, but if you look at the production line of every element that we use, right from the cement which we normally use to the steel and etc. etc. If you look at that line of uh, production, it gives a lot of employment as economy and all that. But you are finally responsible to be the consumer. So here I am. If there are aesthetics, you're talking about how a person experiences the space. Your building is not important, but the experience is important. How it will enhance a person's... Uh, like I, I always imagine that a person, when he walks into a building and when he walks out, is definitely a different person. Good or bad is not the question here. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's take this point, Karun. I, like you made two separate points here, right? So the first point you were making was to say that uh, this question is not justified because we're trying to artificially separate uh, two things which are directly linked to each other. Um, that's a fair point, but the point of asking this question is that, see, I, I feel like. Um, the reason why we ask this question is because more often than not, you're identified primarily through your profession. And that doesn't capture the richness of your existence, right? That doesn't capture the humanity of your existence. And the point of asking this question is to, I mean, you know, you could have said my favorite food is so on and so forth. My yeah, it depends on the profession, actually. Like the other day, uh, Vijay, don't mind me. Like, Vijay was worried about people who are uh, living on a certain site that he's working on, and he wanted to give them good conditions. 
It's not his responsibility, man, if you look at it in black and white. Mm. Let's uh, let's talk about that some more. Now, I actually want to come to the second point of what you were uh, making earlier on, Karun, which is about architecture being a polluted, a polluting or a damaging kind of profession. And we'll just go around the room. We heard uh, a little bit about your perspective on it, but this time we'll go the other way around. So, Varna, um, let's begin by reflecting on the ways in which uh, this way of work, architecture, is unjust. Um, so you can talk about uh, the forms of architecture which you think are unfair um, or reduce the amount of equity in the world. So we'll start backwards and we'll then, start, I mean, because we're saying that architecture as we know it is a little broken, right? And we want to create more humane choices. So let's understand what are the elements of it which are broken before we move into something uh, beyond that. Vana, why don't you uh, kick off? Okay. Um... What I really believe is, you know, when architecture tries to be really heroic and, you know, I think that comes with this whole post-colonialism and identity of the Western modern master coming into India and building monumental buildings, uh, which of course tectonically were probably outstanding, but then that sort of generated, I mean, maybe contextually were not as sensitive, um, nor were they climatically sensitive, not were, nor were they environmentally sensitive. So, and that becoming a sort of module that somehow be becomes a framework for contemporary architecture mm -hmm. uh, to this day in some so many ways um, in India. And also looking at sort of, on the other hand, timeless architecture, which is derived from the vernacular, timeless living architecture. I don't mean monumental spaces that are probably void except for uh, museum purposes or monumental purposes, but things that belong in say villages, smaller towns that are still occupied over generations. I, I believe, um, you know, that kind of architecture sort of related so much more to lifestyles of people. They were adaptable. Uh, they could change with times. And there was, uh, there was a quality of time and change built into them. So, and also a sense of relevancy in that sense and sort of building in um, a sort of symbiosis with the environment. And also looking at our uh, probably regional examples, say in Sri Lanka, which never was touched by the Western modernist master coming in and sort of developing an identity where the identity of architecture was close, is still very closely related to uh, what people and lifestyle is a derivative of people and lifestyle. And probably also of climate um, understanding and respecting the environment and also needs. So that's a very different approach, um, which I think gives a lot of room to, you know, building in conditions where I feel like me, uh, I talk more from a landscape architect's perspective, where my job is not only restoring um, landscapes, whether it's in urban conditions, uh, um, you know, but uh, you know, there is an intrinsic understanding of what a site really needs to be. So I think that's that's something I feel is sort of missing. And also, um, I feel culturally, you know, things which are timeless, um, you know, are things, for example, if you take a temple landscape, which sort of blends into terrain and takes into account time in different perspectives, whether it's uh, morphological or geological, whether it's daily, day and night changes. So can architecture really respond to that and that way become equitable and just in terms of the space it occupies by really being generous to where, you know, the ki kind of condition it occupies rather than just being at a very superficial, um, aesthetic oriented level. Yeah, you know, that's such a good answer because I was actually thinking we would zoom out to the principles a little later in the conversations, but with you guys, I mean, we have to start apparently at a highly better level to begin. Um, Vana, just if I if I may just restate uh, what you're saying, just to make sure I've understood it right. Um, you're suggesting two things, right? So the first thing you're suggesting is that uh, the architect, um, when you consider him as this master craft, and I say him al almost deliberately because it's almost always the him who has to throw himself up in a certain kind of way. And uh, the 
idea that uh, of imposing yourself on a site as opposed to being responsive to a site is one thing that you are uh, speaking about. And I like the distinction that you drew between museum and timelessness, you know, because a museum is also timeless, but it's a, a museum reflects like dead objects in a certain way. And the timelessness that you're speaking about seems to be very alive, you know, it seems to be, it seems to continue to exist so on and so forth. But the point where it was very, it's slightly hard for me to grasp uh, how to interpret what you mean is like, I, I mean, when we thought about pyramids or when we think about temple architecture, so on and so forth, they did very much depend on a master craftsman to be able to establish it. There was a certain sensibility just by virtue of how the, how the discipline was structured at that time that there's one person who knows how everything has to be done and you follow it. Whereas we live in a time where we need to coordinate between many kinds of experts to be able to uh, do certain kinds of work. Um, do you do you feel like this? I mean, why do you think that has happened? Do you, um, this uh, this this shift uh, at, 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 on one hand, like the dissipation of control from the master class, and at the same time creating objects of deadness as opposed to aliveness. I don't know if it has really shifted because I think in the Indian scenario, the architect still continues to be the conductor of the orchestra. I mean, you get to be very lucky if you work with sensitive architects um, and very encouraging, very uh, architects like Bijoy. So, um, you know, but pretty much overall, I feel it's more, uh, it's still very architect driven and led. So, uh, whereas there could be ve very many ways of looking at how do you occupy site and how do you actually build with site. When you're looking at something that is more temporal, more, um, you know, based on site flows and understanding site flows, as opposed to program only yeah. driven. So, I don't and know well, if I'm clear. No, no, I mean, like most people don't know what program means, right? So, can you just tell us what... Uh, being driven by a program versus being driven by a site means? Yeah, so I feel if it's driven by program, it's mostly brief and the client coming in with a list of requirements and uh, mm. sort of imposing the requirements oftentimes on site, um, whether, you know, because the site also needs to be something, the site is telling you something. For example, if a site is beside a Nala and clearly there is a, you know, a you know, um, a buffer left along the Nala, that buffer wants to become a riparian corridor because uh, along a storm, a storm um, water system is where biodiversity uh, sort of lives. So you mm. cannot like turn your face on that, you know, so I'm just giving you an example. So that could be a deciding factor determining how, uh, a, you know, a building or a built object or a program occupies the site. To give you another example, it seems very easy to transplant trees, you know, to rather than build around, but it's not so easy to transplant trees. These trees have lived there and some of them are massive. And in India, we still do not have the technology to transplant massive structures. So why not be sensitive and build around it? So I'm talking about ways of looking at occupying a space and building, um, mm. you know, which is probably more sensitive and attuned with the environment and context. Okay. You know, I feel uh, like you were speaking about a particular project uh, that we will soon name, but, uh, and a particular Nala that we will soon name. Vijay, we'd love your thoughts on uh, this, this point about what it means to uh, build in a way that's appropriate to the site as opposed to a program, because I'm sure you get briefs all the time, right? Like, it's not like real estate is available and abundant, uh, at least in a city context, it's abundant outside of it. But work with what you have. So it's not, I mean, you, you do seem to need a balance between program on one hand and being appropriate to the site on the other hand. Uh, I'd love to hear how you reflect on this question and also hear about what you think about the ways in which architecture is unjust, which is the original question that sort of uh, began to. Well, I'll just go back, Badri, to the comments you made about uh, the master craftsman and the control and how that may be similar in terms of conception to the way we work now. Um, and that's actually a misconception because the master craftsman, and the, we had this wonderful guest, uh, Badri, we've lost your video for some reason. Uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, I, I'm very I much here. To, to, <laughs> to talk. 
uh, it, so we had, we had a wonderful guest from bombay you know a, a teacher in in a col- college called the sea which is school of environment and architecture and prasad made this amazing so he talked about the way we draw and uh, mm-hmm. currently the way we draw is an incredibly european way of drawing it's called orthographic projection so you make plans and sections and elevations and in a way you capture completely or at least that's the belief that you capture completely the spatial configuration of something that you're designing so mm-hmm. he compared it to the drawings that he found you know on a temple site so people make drawings on the wall and what the master craftsman basically establishes are the proportioning systems so he's got dimensions that you know there's a dimension and then everything is then related to that dimension and the craftsmen themselves are free to interpret that proportion with the columns that they're making or with the with the plinth that they're establishing so though the master craftsman has a say a lot of freedom is given just because of the way that it's represented because they aren't making drawings for the whole project beforehand traditionally so the mm-hmm. person who's making the columns when in one corner is interpreting based on this proportioning system what he is doing and so he is bringing to bear into his work his own idea of the world you know whereas today as an architect i produce a set of drawings and god forbid you change anything in that on site you know you're going to break everything down and so that that is i mean it's a good it's a good point to bring out because that control system that that sort of chain of command the thing that varna is talking about that's what's kind of broken and of course you realize that over time that sometimes you got to listen or not sometimes but most times it's actually in the collective wisdom of things that that great things can happen so that's one thing the second thing about timelessness that varna mentioned and it reminded me of a of a of a comment that doshi had made doshi is is the, is the great architect who won the pritzker award last year two years ago and so someone asked him when he was uh, there was a question answer session i think at the pritzker or the event before the pritzker and someone asked him like what's timeless architecture like what what is timelessness and so he said you know when you go to a a nice place a nice building and you sit and then uh, it's time for you to go but then you look at your watch and say chalo we will sit for some more time that's timelessness right <laughs> that's like are wow what a lovely place now come on forget about everything you know how can you get that you know into a building where you just feel like it's languid and then coming back to karun's comment about uh, you know on the one hand is this incredible and i completely agree with him you know it's an incredibly devastating sort of exercise because you of course rape the land you make five basements you've got materials from everywhere you know made in the most you know terrible fashion and you make this beautiful building but if you're going through that process and going to have this amazing building and the building is poetic and it moves you and it it, it gives you a sense of yourself like i am bangalore right it's an incredible amount of concrete an incredible amount of stone all quarried from somewhere to just think of it my boggles the mind like what amount of devastation must have gone behind this building but when you go there it moves you completely right it's a it's a moving poetic experience now if you're going to do if you're going to go down that route and you're going to make this incredibly sort of all consuming building make sure that it's going to last for 200 years which means that it's flexible to accommodate all kinds of changes in program so you got to be a really a, a, a genius right a building that can accommodate change will last without too much of maintenance is robust like a lot of our temples and has that sort of you know provenance over time that's one mm. but if you can't do that if you can't make buildings of that quality then do what karun is doing which is to make buildings which are ephemeral which you can put on the site and when you decide you've had enough of it you can wrap it up and take it somewhere else and plonk it somewhere else or use it for something else totally so mm. I, i i don't want to make it completely the two extremes maybe there's a middle path between these two but i think if you are going down that route of making permanent architecture which is you know profoundly wasteful at least think of it in the long term of its long life that you know mm. how can housing become like for instance there's a great example of it in boston where the back bay which is a 19th century development all reclaimed from the charles river and they made this development developers did it but mm. the housing stock they are all sort of these uh, 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 what do you call them uh, stoop houses right they've got stoops in front of them red brick etc but the proportions the height of the floor the width of each of these blocks they're so flexible 
that over the over the past 200 years these buildings have been used for housing first but now mm. they accommodate studios they accommodate offices they accommodate shops they accommodate mm. all kinds of things things have been combined to make large big box retail how can you make architecture that can that can last a long time so that all of this waste is then uh, offset by the use over time mm. so i i guess there are these two directions i didn't answer your question there you had no, no no i did i mean we were talking about this inequity in the work itself but we'll come back to that i feel like the path that we're on in our conversation is far more interesting at least uh, first to follow more the first point that you made about timelessness reminded me a lot about um, uh, about doshi saying that you know you look at your watch and say you want to hang around reminds me of this example that einstein apparently used to explain relativity to people right he used to say, uh, Relativity is that idea where uh, you know, it, sitting with with a beautiful woman for one hour feels like one second, and sitting on a hot stuff for one second feels. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about I, I was thinking about timelessness as I mean, like the lack of time in the sense that it's, time it's is a beautiful this. woman, <laughs> the timeless or beautiful man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, Einstein was a sexist fellow. We we know this as a matter of fact, you know. So we'll. we we'll leave the morality of that statement aside but uh, to understand this term as the disappearance of time to say that time is not what is going is not the axis around which you evaluate change uh, is a one thought i think it links to the second point you made about i am right because i i used to wonder the same thing in the context of the uh, new airport in bangalore and the and the road that you've built like the number of farmers whose lands were taken away uh, the number of people who were enriched or uh, monetarily by the acquisition of these lands because there were uh, politics around it which are not entirely transparent to the public at all um you know it it really begs the question it's almost as though the cost of building i am uh, or the cost of building beautiful flyovers and all of these like grand things is meant to mask the mask the damage that you're doing you know like when you when you show magnificence it's like the question of what came before the magnificence almost disappears entirely so the third point that you made was actually really interesting which is to say that there's a ba- i mean if you are going to aim for magnificence let it be so magnificent that the it overcomes the cost of uh, damage that you do uh, through your activity and then you linked it back to whether you should think about it as a matter of ephemerality or you should think about it as timeless you know mm-hmm. and i actually think even the ephemeral is timeless in a certain way and this is where like karun's point on this is going to be super interesting because i know you captured karun's work right now as a matter of um, building structures he says uh, i'd like to build buildings like cars that you can dismantle and take to another site and make right. it something else and he says much like the boston bay example he says that land needs to um, take on many forms and utility over time so what is a mall today could be a school tomorrow or an apartment or complex day after tomorrow there's no reason for that not to be the case right that's what being organic means but that's a kind of timelessness which comes out of ephemerality today so it's actually in my mind it's not so much a spectrum but it's actually the same thing whether you build a structure which is so timeless that it's monumental or it's so timeless in that it becomes something else by tomorrow you know it's the it's it, it, it sounds ridiculous in any context which is not poetic but uh, maybe it's not appropriate for general conversation but that's that's what i'm taking from what you're saying but Karun I know has a whole I mean, one take which he talks about every day and uh, Karun I'd love to hear from you about how you think about what is appropriate and uh, this is this is this is a no I I'd like to take it from first of all to answer Varna's question you know I think also architects because they come under many commercial kind of forces uh are kind of uh, responsible to do so and so and they have their own dreams and stuff of stuff like that but the first thing i'd like to tell uh, uh, to address varna's question is like we have to distinguish between building and architecture most of the time that the people who like i do completely agree with you that a uh, landscape a person who's involved in the landscape has to come at, come at the same time with the architect as it comes in and it is the architect's responsibility to uh, get the landscape person involved and work together and 
and other people. I'd like to involve botanists and people like that. But the distinction between architecture and building is very important. I think about 80 to 90 percent of, I'm sorry, I'm not politically correct, I'll go for it in any case. 80 to 90 percent of the architects who build, they don't do architecture. So then it's so. Uh, I have to explain what that means, Karun, because otherwise we are just going to have raised eyebrows and uh, no, questions. No, no, no. I, I, I think at least the panel would understand the uh, distinction between or uh, between architecture and building. That, that's for sure. That's for sure. Because you can build a, they, like what, what happens around is like, like uh, what Varna is talking about is very big, very sensitive to the land. But I'd like to call everybody to this particular conscious about this city of Bangalore. It is the only city on earth, other than Mexico City, which is not built, which supports a population more than 10 million and is not built, built along a river. It's a city that lives on rainwater harvesting, man. And we fill up our lakes. And like if we guys, who come from this uh, this kind of uh, know-how? Don't say anything about it. Let's say okay. Coming over, uh, coming to the point about uh, timeless architecture, ephemeral architecture, and can we find a middle path and all that? What what are we doing about killing ourselves? It's, it's suicide. Basically, Bangalore. If you look at it, it is suicide. We, we use non-renewable resources, which is, uh, we use uh, river sand, which is over, we bust it. Uh, now we beating up the rocks and making it into sand. And then we beat, beat the rocks up to make, a, make bigger, how do you say, pieces to mix it in concrete. And it's material that's been wait, waiting for the past four, four and a half billion years. And okay. Every urban building, according to a little bit of study that we've done, is lasts for 40, to 40 years to 100 years, you know, max. And uh, I, I like Bujai when he says that 200 years, I hope people do that. You know? <laughs> That's Ruskin. Ruskin said that. That's Ruskin's charge, you know. Build if you can, but build it for 200 years. Yes, Nobody yeah. can do it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, but, but then we, we, we use non-renewable non resources and then in, yeah, let's say in 200 years, there's four and a half billion and in 200 years, we pull it down and it goes into a landfill. And yes, uh, with vernacular architecture and everything is very nice, but anyway, it's going down in 200 years, but you use material like, let's talk about this glorified, romanticized uh, tile roof. You know that the tile is not going to be earth ever again. Yeah? And yeah, yeah in, in, in 50 to 200 years, it's a part of a landfill. And I, 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 I do love vernacular architecture. I do love everything. But today we're sitting in 2020. Sorry, the 21st century, let's say. Can we rethink the situation of being self-glorified? Basically, I don't know. I've been, again, in a certain way, maybe the masters that who put in, they built monuments for themselves, you know. This is a this has been a question for me. Yeah, and I think since I have a little bit of a, a history with France. Uh, Corbusier is considered as a person who built a history for himself. He did not acknowledge even Eileen Gray, who, who adopted his theories and built better than him in a certain way. That E1073, I think that, that's the thing that she built in the Riviera. So there's a whole lot of things, but it, it, when, you, when you look at uh, architecture that way, you're looking at a fi the film industry. Heroes are having problems with each other and 
getting each other down. And I just thought uh, today was a day. It's funny that I'm saying this, that I saw on change.org that the uh, petition that you signed that there was, I don't even know his name. I'm sorry, I don't follow film anymore or movies anymore. There's a person who killed himself because he wasn't very, is that so important? Like, we, we architects, even today, we're in a self-glorification path, you know? But I agree with Varna who says like, hey, why do we have to self-glorify? But actually at the same time, the profession is so wonderful. It feeds us so much. And most of all, you build for the people. And at a certain point, I'm sorry, I'm talking all this, but at a certain point, you don't even consider the people who are going to occupy that building. Consider, let's consider a residential building. You don't even consider them. Like, like if you, in the architecture, it's okay, we consider in a certain way, but in the building sector, we think they're just like, Chicken is a poultry, man. It's a stack of poultry. You build in those people because of their, how do you say, handicaps, mostly economical handicaps. So yeah, they, they will buy it and they'll adapt to it, especially in India, people will adapt to it. We as a culture are aspirational and we, will, we are not the wallen types, you know. I, I think the little bit that I know in a multi, globally multicultural society, like I always keep telling Bajri this, uh, the biggest immigrant population, one of the biggest, sorry, not the biggest, one of the biggest immigrant population in, on earth is the other Indians. Mm. But uh, they don't short change. They work hard, they study hard and they get there. You don't have Indian gangs anywhere, man. New York City doesn't have an Indian gang. Paris doesn't have an Indian gang. But you have Hispanic, you have Blacks, and etc., etc. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there can be other reasons for that, which are uh, also sociological, not purely based on. Uh, I mean, uh, not. not I, I think it's a mentality of the of, of a certain. Uh, uh, a certain cultural consciousness that we have from this part of the world. You know. mm. yeah. That's interesting. So let's pause on that point there because you said like many interesting things. A uh, uh, couple of threads that we can sort of see uh, not necessarily in the same direction as Varna or Bijoy. So it'll be, it'll be nice to hear what they have to say about um, this aspect of glorifying the site versus glorifying the artist. And I, I do feel like all of you are actually on the same side of what needs to be glorified, um, which is the land that you're working with, the resources that you're using. And um, I, I welcome the point that you're making about the fact that even if you're building like 200 year old buildings, the cost of those 200 year old buildings is working with material which is billions of years old. So do we truly actually, even with 200 year old buildings, do we truly maximize the value of the material that we have to sacrifice to be able to build uh, this question i think is an important no, question it'll be yeah but i'd like to say non -re non renewable material non renewable material okay yeah. fair enough wood and That's... steel you can go yeah you can be renewed but when you look at minerals that we use from earth and and we kind of treat it in a certain way that is non reversible mm to go back to its state. No. This, uh, that's a question. You know, that's a, that, it's a very fair question. I, I, like, let's shift the conversation a little bit because um, I think the point of departure from the first question to the next part of the conversation is how do you think about the user of your buildings? You know, like uh, Bijoy spoke about it a little earlier in the context of this sensual experience of timelessness, right? And uh, Karun, you just brought it up in the context of uh, utility. You know, or what is the aspiration of the person you're designing for? Uh, Varna spoke about it in terms of building with the site so that um, the encounter with that, uh, with the object of architecture is continuing. It's not something that ends with the building of that building itself, right? So 
I would love to invite all three of you to reflect on how you think about the users of your building uh, using an example from your work, right? So pick pick a site uh, that you have worked on and think about how you contemplated the user in a way which you think is most consistent with your philosophy for what it means to uh, do good architecture, right? So uh, Bijay, let's start with you on this question because I also feel like it would be worthwhile for you to respond to uh, Karun's point just now, uh, earlier on how, I mean, I, I, I don't know how much you want to reflect on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you uh, to reflect on it and then uh, move into this question of the user of a building and a project that you've been working on. Well, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm completely in agreement with Karun about, uh, about the renewable, renewable material sort of, uh, you know, way of working where you use things that can be reused later. Um, I haven't really thought about it in very sophisticated terms. I haven't done buildings that, that are, you know, go that in that direction. Uh, but yeah, I guess, I mean, just talking about it in theory seems uh, fair enough that maybe that's the way one should go. Buildings are made out of lots of components. I mean, there are lots of things that go into buildings. Uh, of course, first you ask the question, you know, what, like, what are you doing? What do you need to do? What, you know, you're taking that model step with your client. And then the next question is, how are you going to get there? You know, what, what are the means by which you're going to use, you know, what materials, etc. And in the making of something, I mean, there are lots of components to these buildings. So I don't know how, to what extent you take that argument about renewability, and it's something to think about. Um, so I don't know, the 200 year magic may not work. And I don't know if there are, you know, maybe then you have to go back to Elora or something. And then, then it's kind of meaningful. I don't know. Uh, what so, about the, or the pyramids, uh, which is completely useless artifact, but it's still there. Uh, so uh, is that architect, is that, is that worth it? You know, <laughs> it's not even from, from the locality. So anyway, uh, I haven't thought about it in, in great detail. And maybe Karun can sort of tell us about how you take it all the way through as an argument. Um, mm. The second question about the users, uh, and I'll give, uh, if you permit me, I'll give you two examples. So one, one is from, from one of those film star heroes. Give um, us many. Yeah, the, the one is from the film star heroes from Khan. Okay, so I'm, I'm currently doing a paper on uh, a project that Khan never finished. It's a, it's a, a project called the Dominican Mother House. And the mm. argument I'm making in the paper is that um, we look at these great heroes and we think that the architecture comes out of their brain, right? That they just sat down and drew it up and this is how the building got done. And what, what the study of the, the drawings that are in the archive in, the, in UPenn tell us is that A, of course, Khan had some ideas about the project and his first scheme fell back on a lot of the tropes he was using in other projects. So he used templates from other places and he laid out the plan of this building. But over the course of two years that he worked on this project, things like the budget, things like a deeper understanding of the site, and most importantly, the engagement with the sisters of the monastery impacted his work fundamentally, changing the scheme into what is a very sophisticated plan at the end of that process. So the source of this great project, the masterwork, doesn't come from Khan. It comes through these negotiations with many people. And mm -hmm. we don't look at the work like that at all. Cobb seems to be the guy who just can pull these things out of a hat. And I'm sure, you know, there are people like Mahinder Raj, or I don't know whoever, I mean, people, young engineers who are working in, in Chandigarh or young, you know, a young architect in Chandigarh, someone who is having conversations or even his PWD clients, you know, who's impacting Cobb's work in fundamental ways. So we have to look at architecture, not as the work of the master, you know, the, the, the master, but the work of negotiation and compromise, all architecture is like that. To bring one example from our own work, of course, you know, both Neve and BIC are great examples of that kind of collaboration between a client and an architect, mm -hmm. not so much with contractors or, you know, even landscape Varna kind of came and filled in the gaps and it would have been better if she, she was in there from the start. But nonetheless, with the client, especially Neve, I think more than BIC even, we had a client, Kavita Sabarwal was our client, Kavita Gupta Sabarwal, and she, she is a very, very sort of, uh, has very strong opinions, has a very clear idea of the world. She came back to India from Singapore, saw that none of the schools were worth her while. She didn't think any of them could, you know, deal with her kids properly. 
and so set up her own school because she had her own philosophy about education so to have a client like that who has a very sophisticated understanding of how she wants to teach st students the building we did for neve reflects that collaboration fundamentally in terms of how they use it and in that case buildings will have a much longer life because you know there is a there is a shared uh, mission if you will for the project just like bic where you know the the, the building committee ravi chandra and his group and ragu they were instrumental in the way that building has turned out and it is nothing like our competition entry it's a great example of something that's completely changed through those conversations and negotiations and site conditions uh, so i yeah. don't think yeah anyway that's yeah no, I, 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 that was a uh, there was a beautiful point bijoy but the um, idea of talking about architecture as a shared enterprise i think you know it also harkens back to another notion which i fundamentally believe which is basically that you know we do have professions and specialists but that's really a function of capitalism and uh, labor being organized into these separate uh, boxes you know but in a certain way we all make choices across disciplines like um, i make a choice architecturally when i choose to occupy a house you know one house as opposed to another house uh, i make a choice as a lawyer when i choose whether i want to skip, jump a red light or not you know uh, i make a choice uh, of being a policeman let me if i'm policing another person's capacity to uh speak or not speak or exercise violence or not exercise violence so mm, i do recognize that the the idea that architecture is a shared enterprise is is something that uh, resonates very deeply with me but the the point i do feel though is unanswered is thinking about the inhabitants now with uh with the first project that you mentioned uh louis kan's um project you you're talking about uh, you're talking about the nuns who are going to inhabit it now can you say that i mean we've also linked uh, neve and uh, the neve page from your website on our live stream so if if people mm -hmm. want to check it out they can come and uh, check it out and i've actually uh, come to the school and enjoyed it with you and vadna as well so it was uh, i mean so i can totally see what what you mean when you say that um, someone having a nebulous understanding of uh, what the building is supposed to be used for Yeah. Really informs what you're building, but can you say a little more about the users? You know, um, did you also spend time, for instance, with the children who would occupy it? Uh, with BIC, did you think about um, the kind of um, citizens of these buildings? Um, no. So you, I mean, it's it's very difficult. I mean, just in terms of process to physically engage with, uh, especially in communal buildings, with, to physically engage and get feedback on on you know. the way people will use we had this argument once in the office with one of the young interns and he said you know we should make excel sheets and spread it out and get feedback on what kind of spaces you need etc i think over time architects kind of uh, they 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 intuitive they they intuit certain conditions they sort of test them out they they are inhabiting the building as they design it so that they are picturing themselves within these spaces using them in different ways and creating scenarios by which they are sort of uh, you know imagining how the places will be used i mean this is this is the the way that you know most architects work uh, in communal buildings it's very difficult i mean if you're doing a house of course you know your engagement with the end client is a lot more visceral you're you're yeah. getting a lot of feedback from them you're getting very specific instruction from them in these sorts of communal buildings in most probably there is a representative or a committee that you're dealing with and in fact you are then imagining for yourself how people may use it what uh, kinds of qualities you want to you know you want to evoke uh, you know where are places of repose where are places of prospect those sorts of things so you i think it's a, it's a it's a it's an exercise of just sort of imagining and and sort of projecting um, sorry 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 <laughs> my time's up yeah my time's up <laughs> No, no, Vijay. It's not. That was uh, my mom. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, I was thinking that you'd be tuned into this, you know, she was, because she was, she was calling to tell me to stop talking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, why are moms doing that? Uh, this yeah, has yeah. been happening all their lives. But Vijay, I, I, I think what you're trying to say, which is that, with, um, you know, what I'm hearing you say is actually that it's a balance between listening and speaking. you know in a, uh, there's a there's a listening element of your work which is trying to understand what the re representative committee or your users might understand 
and the speaking element is a matter of imagination uh, no, no, so it's the, a, i i don't mean to say that the architect is some sort of a benign entity that you know just receives information and then goes and does the stuff you know uh, i mean absolutely. we bring uh, like you know karun has his agenda as an architect as a as a creative person he has a world view varna has her world view and her sort of values and 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 positions we all bring to bear as creative and that's that's the nice thing about i mean what Kar, you know karun said right at the outset i mean as as a professional what all of us are interested in is in having a positive engagement with the world that means that we're bringing ourselves into the world and we're engaging with what we're seeing in front of us in in and trying to make a positive change whatever that may be in our world view you know so i'm getting all of this feedback from my clients but i also bring to that conversation my own point of view so kavita has her point of view we've had arguments we come to some kind of negotiate which is why i said you know that at the end of the day mm. great architecture is the work of a of a fine negotiation you know where someone sort of step back mm. someone pulled forward and it's like a, it's like a dance you no know? you just did it beautifully and it it was wonderful you know at the end a dance I mean, with a whole lot of patience and not always what's that a dance with a whole lot of patience <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> this I, I you know what i'm also taking from it is that it's clearly not a solo performance whatever else it is sure, uh, sure. No, i i think that's the whole difference but between uh, what happened uh, at the outset of modernism and all that and as of today do it, it is not a solo performance you need and it's time it's like high time that people understand that the architect yes he is a part of the whole team that gets it built you can draw all the drawings that you want i mean maybe you have encountered them first time with me here and there so you can do all that you want but finally it's the guy who pours the concrete or who welds the steel if, if that guy doesn't know the craft or he the yeah and if the people who are who are supposed to direct him to do the way it's supposed to be done now and like vijay was saying earlier there's a whole lot of factors which are influ- influencing the the outcome of the product i call it the product like the building right mm. you the architect finally is not in control if 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 he doesn't how do you say dance the way mm. he's supposed to dance so then there are uh, dilutions limitations like if i could go back to what louis kahn always said like you know he said the role of a successful architect is correct me if i'm wrong vijay he said the uh, the role of a successful architect is when he reduces the gap between the immeasurable and the measurable and that in today's context is not like what it was in the 50s and the 60s you know mm. yeah like no i mean the kind of stakes that people put into their buildings like uh, like i think uh, i would like to i have this uh, nice uh, story if a guy who comes a guy who is retired from a government job and he got some 60 lakhs or 50 lakhs to build a house that's all the money he's got man do justice to it at the same time when a developer comes to you with some 480 crore some ridiculous money yeah that's all the money he's got you're in the high stake game in any case and i didn't choose to be in that high stake game you know but like when another person's life depends on it it's not like a fashion designer when you yeah it is so it's not like that the fashion designer messes up on a dress that he makes for for a client he can say okay i'll make another one yeah in this case is nearly a zero error kind of a job that you have to do yeah then not like, he's not like a rocket scientist but yeah mm. the, this um i i i think that's a very fair i it, it, it clearly the stakes with uh, building buildings is very different from making clothes i think that's a fair point and we need to acknowledge no, the, that the thing is i i think one has to agree that we've been talking over the same thing but you have to agree that the architect is in control mm-hmm. but but not really 
Not really. <laughs> Right. And I, I, mean, I think everybody who's been in the profession know, knows that the carpet has been pulled under your feet when you <laughs> least ex expect it, you know? Right. And it's not that's delivered good. by the other person either. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, that's what I suppose Bijoy is speaking of when he says uh, negotiation. And it's, yeah. it's interesting that you're echoing uh, in the same direction. Let's hear from Varna now, because the negotiation is very different when you work with landscape, right? Because I remember with Neve, both with Neve and the Bangalore International Center, uh, both of which um, Varna did the landscape for, um, her negotiation is both with nature itself, uh, the people who use it, uh, the maintenance of all of this, and the client and their own aspirations. So in a cer certain way, I feel it's both more subtle and more expressive than the role of an architect. Uh, because it's really, it recedes even more the kind of sensations that she needs to tap into to be able to uh, shape the environment is a very, very uh, clearly a very fine balance. But now, what do you have to say about this, uh, this kind of conversation about thinking about the user and the other parties to the negotiation, which uh, results in your work? Um, I think it's very interesting how Bijoy looks at it mostly as negotiation clients. And I wish you know, landscape architecture was not still an emerging profession in India where these negotiations would become easy with clients. Right. Still very emergent um, as a profession in India. So uh, really an understanding of what landscape is, what landscape can mean, and also looking at it, not just from the human user perspective, but like not just an anthropocentric perspective, looking at it, you know, in a, a, a whole, um, in a more holistic manner, I suppose. That would probably be the negotiation. And um, I guess, uh, you know, it's not, it's not with architecture when an ego comes in. Here, it's mostly about nurturing an environment because this uh, environment cannot be replaced. You know, it's, it's, it's a living, thriving environment. And a lot of times, it's also a resilient environment. But once again, I think negotiations with users probably come in with the maintenance. Maintaining when you have an idea of wilderness, urban wilderness, the fact that this urban wilderness, however resilient, also needs to be maintained. Also that people can engage with this kind of en environment because it's a very rich, biodiverse environment with the I'm talking about more in, uh, you know, a public institution scenario like BIC, where uh, people can actually engage in these spaces. Um, you know, it comprises of actually creating a rich habitat system. So uh, while a more manicured idea of uh, a landscape is more easily understood, I feel personally, uh, you know, our Indian system is very sophisticated because our cultural landscapes are so sophisticated. People use their feet to navigate terrains, whether it's paths of pilgrimages. Every day there are rangolis that are put. So it's it's actually already a rich system. We're using all our senses and more, you know, and there's this whole notion of human consciousness also that's built into this system. I just feel like if we can bring back this tradition of sort of not really only thinking of it in terms of aesthetics, but also experiencing it more than just, you know, um, walking through the space or being in the space, looking at it as a larger systemic uh, approach. I think, you know, sort of in, in that sense, a landscape architect does need to become an activist still here. And maybe that's not always a scenario that's expected because when people are looking at it more from um, setback design, beautification of space, to look at beauty and aesthetics in terms of a performative space, whether it's cleansing water, whether it's filtering water, whether it's creating cooler microclimates and thereby creating a nicer environment for the built space too. I think these are things that uh, is sort of a different sense of negotiation. But end of the day, I think the landscape really needs to be meaningful and memorable for people to actually become stewards of any kind of space. So um, I think that's the challenge. Hmm, that is a challenge, but it, 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 would you say that's a unique challenge to landscape in a way that's not because I feel like your answer is shifting a little bit when you start talking about um, the landscape architect as a steward of nature, as a steward of biodiversity, 
um, and not just the clients that you're working with. So in a certain way, like you're almost subverting the project of beautification through your work, right? Um, yeah. Important for you to uh, be able to meet the aspiration for beautification without compromising on what you think is an ideal relationship between uh, a, a human and the environment that you experience. And also, I mean, the question of aesthetics, what is aesthetics? Why aren't we celebrating the everyday ordinary, you know, which we see around us? Why do we need to actually refer to something as beautiful that is brought in from outside? Why can't we celebrate, um, you know, spaces we are familiar with that we encounter with through our work? Maybe, you know, that's where that whole negotiation of what is beauty, what is acceptable, what is, uh, you know, sort of more closely related to our culture, perhaps, comes in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, a very fair point. You know, in um, this, uh, this point, actually, I, I, I'd love to hear what Karun has to say about it, because, I mean, you know, almost unwittingly, we've sort of put it in two kinds of camps. One is this... Um, working with the resources which are available to us and doing the best we can. And the other view that Karun seems to be championing is one which takes the advantages of modernism, which is to be able to assimilate knowledge from different directions and make it culturally appropriate to this present. So uh, the question that I would like to ask all of you right now is what it means to be indigenous to right now. You know, what does it mean to be indigenous to right now uh, through your work and uh, not in terms of just the idealization, but also to be appropriate to this year and this time. If you were to think about the directions in which you want to develop your practice, uh, what would you say it would be? And um, this time, Vijay, we'll, uh, we'll start with you and then perhaps uh, think about a little more. It would also be interesting for you all, uh, given how much the recent lockdown must have uh, affected your day-to-day uh, -day existence, right? Like, I'd love for you to reflect on what you've learned from the recent past that is sort of timeless in your uh, aspirations for how your practice evolves henceforth. Because in a certain way, architecture has been fundamentally transformed, I feel. Because real estate is one of those things where um, what we know of as valuable has been artificially inflated for many, many generations. And finally, that has been exposed and that automatically means that the nature of your profession has also changed a little bit. I know that, um, Bijoy, at least with you, you've taken a, a, a evolved in the direction of your education and the education of others. I know that Karun has started thinking about other aspects of lifestyle besides just uh, the work that he does. And Vagna, you and I recently have been talking more and more about uh, working on studies, right? So um, I feel like there's a certain long today. Uh, the, the long-term kind of approach which is uh, coming into your work. And I'd like to understand what the result of that, what the direction of the result of that is um, moving henceforth. So um, I don't know if that question was like too abstract, but you people deal with the abstract far better than I do. So Bijoy, what do you, uh, how would you reflect on this? Well, you asked me to start for the toughest question of the day. <laughs> uh, well, the... the yeah, I don't want to be pontificating. I mean, the, the pandemic, on the one hand, of course, has been a source of great uh, insecurity and uncertainty, like for everybody else, I guess. Um, the first and foremost reaction, like I think a lot of architects had and a lot of friends had, was to suddenly be aware, like I said it, you know, earlier on in the conversation, to suddenly be aware of these large groups of people who make our buildings, who, you know, for, you know, for the longest time have been invisible, sort of. The only time I remember were, you know, on projects where uh, we were doing projects uh, early on in our career for Hope Foundation, where we'd done these, uh, you know, orphanages in schools in, in the middle of, uh, you know, the hinterland in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Man, for the, in those projects, for some reason, I had a much more sort of direct relationship with the people who were actually building these buildings for us. Uh, so we were in touch with them. You know, there was uh, there were storms uh, occasionally on one of the sites. So we were, you know, immediately sort of trying to get there, trying to do something with them, etc. But but after that, as as you know, our our uh, our projects uh, sort of uh, you know. Uh, increased in scale, uh, we've sort of lost touch with the people who actually, like Arun said, you know, the people who actually make the buildings, we really don't have, uh, you know, that connection at all. So the first thing I did, uh, I mean, and this, Badri, you've been uh, party to this, 
is you know we we are working currently on a project for the Indian Institute of Science and uh, we were we were just at that threshold of getting a contractor on board for the project and uh, so what we did is and we'd already done all of the paperwork we sent him the contractor's uh, agreement with the client which is a template that the PMC had made and that template had been shared with the contractor and that was in the tender document this contract for labor terms that they had to use on their sites and i hadn't even looked at it right because it was cut pasted from some older document that we probably had used somewhere else and so it was just sent to the contractor like that without any checking and after this uh, the pandemic happened i took a look at that document again i i sent it to of course i sent it to badri but i also sent it to other another architect friend of mine to just take a look at it and to, to see if there was anything that you know sort of stood out as being strange and you wouldn't believe it but you know of the i think there are around uh, i want to say that there are around 50 odd clauses in that in terms of uh, you know we had questions and badri's friend rahul helped us with this we had questions on i think 30 or 40 of those you know in terms of like what does this mean or what why is this worded like this why is 15 years the minimum age for someone to to work at site uh, why aren't there any terms in the contract with regards to the the living conditions of the workers whether they're on site or elsewhere why aren't there mm-hmm. any terms in the contract that we're giving to the client with regards to the insurance that is going to be guaranteed for the labor these are not mm-hmm. concerns that i've come to through some sophisticated understanding of legal i mean this is just common sense right i mean if i was to enter into a contract with a bunch of people with a client mm-hmm. i would ask for these terms to be or I, i would i would be you know privy to these or i would be careful to make sure i understood those terms and mm-hmm. so that i mean we haven't made much headway with it so we sent both rahul's comments i added a whole bunch of other comments which are kind of ideal situation if in an ideal world we were able to do this here are the mm-hmm. things so the karnataka state you know labor laws have certain stipulations for maternity leave and what happens when people so a lot of contractors just don't hire women because there's just this whole other dimension so they they have limited number of women on site invariably then there's terms and conditions with regards to the crash and other amenities and you should see the the qualifications for the crash it has to have a thatch roof it has to have a, you know an a, a mud plinth at least i mean these are minimum standards right for a for a crash or a, for a common building on site so i'm wondering you know what happened so i i spoke to a contractor after having spoken to badri i'm sorry i'm taking too long but no no I, I, just, just another minute but after speaking to badri i spoke to one of my contractors just to get a sense because i reached out to karun as well and said you know is there a system we can deploy that you know maybe we can start thinking of it as a systemic uh, you know improvement in the conditions that because he's got a, a beautiful example of a deployable metal uh, structure for housing and so when i went to the contractor you know he sat me down he said you know this is all very good you know fantastic you know we should do this and of course i want to treat my people uh, well and then he mm-hmm. he brought out a chart of his calculations in terms of cost and where you know he's being this is not for iisc but this was another project where he was already appointed and this is ramesh babu varna who you know well so he gave me his his cost sheet of what at the end of the day the client has negotiated him down for payment and of that what percentage of it goes into all of the the stuff that he's supporting for you know labor lines etc 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 so i don't mm. know after that and i spoke to you i think badri right after that and i was completely despondent because i felt like i was this naive you know babe in the woods who suddenly mm. woke up and wants to change the world you know and 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 the systems are so comprehensively i mean it's complex i mean karun's laughing smiling you know yeah, i'm I mean, sorry i work on site i put my hands i pull my concrete sometimes yeah so <laughs> i i don't and, and so it, it just sort of came as a as as just you know helplessness really that i mean if you want to make a change then what kind of systems do we introduce and we got to start at ground zero right how much are we paying people how much yeah. you know what is a what like, so if i'm so here's what at the end of all of this the mm. the kind of thing that i was thinking would be maybe workable is to say that in any contract there was a yeah. fixed sum that we came to which was non negotiable in terms of and all contractors were paid make a change stipulation and that the new amount was set so that that doesn't get compromised 
So what's the basic I need for housing? What's the basic I need for amenities? And these are scalable models, right? If I have a team of 50 people, if I have a team of 500 people, maybe there's a way to compute this, at least to get a main standard done. Yeah. So, so that's my two cents. Yeah. I mean, that was more like $2, uh, Vijay. There was a lot of sense in that, uh, in those points. But I'm going to just pick up on three threads because, see, I don't think the aspiration here is common sense because that's not a fair representation of the viewpoint you're taking. You're talking about encountering your humanity in a way that you've never had to in this context, right? You're talking about uh, relating to the people who work on site and make uh, make the work that you do uh, possible. So there's that's really the beginning of this exercise and the other two points that you made about uh, you know the contracts in law we say that um, the precondition to contract is that you have capacity to contract and there's a meeting of minds right there's an offer acceptance and consideration so something to say that there is an offer that's been made and the acceptance has taken place most of the contracts that most people enter into actually don't have capacity you don't even have the power to negotiate these contracts and these contracts end up being exploitative because we just assume that they are defaults, you know. And unfortunately, the defaults that we have set in our system is one of restraint and not one of freedom and liberation and dignity. And that's really the pity here. And, and I, I sort of follow where you're coming from. And uh, then the, the third point that you made about despondency, I think uh, all work begins with despondency, right? In a certain way, you're coming in contact with... Um, questions which might, I mean, insecurities which might plague someone who's at the start of their practice. And um, in your life and your practice, you've obviously uh, have had the privilege of overcoming it. And I suppose we just have to do it all over again. I mean, now the question is whether one has the um, capacity, um, the, the, the ways in which we can be invested are actually many fold. And I think the cause that you're picking um, of trying to renegotiate these contracts are probably more important than the buildings that you've designed, you know, because like if we do make a change of this sort, then it has far more lasting effect in terms of the dignity of future generations. And the co-creation that you were speaking of when you said the proportion system where the plinth maker had an understanding of it based on his interpretation, where the, uh, the site was actually made by many people, there's a disaggregated form of control, becomes more realizable. Because sharing in dignity enables more generosity, right, from each participant uh, in the exercise. So I, I, I thought that was a really like wonderful uh, nuanced take on this uh, question of how it's evolving your practice. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, Varna, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, and uh, then we'll uh, come to you, Karan. So um, Varna, do you want to go next? Okay. I mean, I mean, I, I think it's wonderful how uh, Bijoy has really managed to look at this huge issue and I think as a community of designers we really need to support this effort. I mean it's just been very profound and I don't think what I've done over um, you know probably lockdown even measures up to you know beginning to think about this so I think it's really wonderful Bijoy has uh, started uh, this effort and you know we're all there to support it. I think as every you know, it's every designer's, um, you know, onus to actually, you know, support this and see what can be done. Uh, I think my lockdown was also, like Bijoy said, initially a very confusing uh, period, but uh, post which, I mean, there was confusion and post which it turned out to be quite an incredible experience um, for us as a small team of designers. Uh, we uh, looked at using this confusion and establishing a platform called Design United um, as a positive platform for regional design collaborations um, and opportunity. You know, we encountered, we saw that there were a lot more students, design students, young designers without opportunities brought in through lockdown. So um, a part of this whole Design United uh, has led to design conversations, which is weekly conversations with uh, incredible young designers from uh, the region, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, sharing their design journeys and approaches. Uh, basically a pure mentorship group um, sharing and encouraging one another. But what has really been very key to this is a very careful selection of designers. I mean, mostly designers who sort of share a resonance with the place they are from. They're really genuinely interested in giving back to the communities. And um, 
you know, we've had people like Kolpa Wall from Nepal that works with uh, indigenous and nomadic uh, tribes in uh, Nepal working with natural fibers. We've had uh, people like a young designer from uh, Bangalore who's looking at uh, distributing, designing and distributing solar lamps um, to street vendors in Karnataka. So this extremely multidisciplinary um, collaborative atmosphere which is creating opportunities for young designers has absolutely been very buoyant. Um, you know, this Saturday we have a conversation with um, an experiential and game designer from Pakistan, Nashra, um, you know, and we've had uh, 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 designers who've spoken about participatory planning, social planning. So um, that's been something great, something very enriching for all of us. Also, personally, as an office and a practice, we've been looking at uh, making films of our work that talk about the importance of landscape in um, sort of impacting the environment. We've had design charrettes. So personally and professionally, it's been um, both a confusing and a very professionally enriching period. Yeah, that's, I mean, thanks, Varna. I, uh, I really think that the impact towards education and collaboration has been strengthened a lot uh, in this crisis. Uh, because it sort of made it obvious that communion, communion is the only way ahead, you know. Uh, it's the only form of like self-expression, growing together is the only way to uh, do it. And um, Tarun, I, I wanted to come to you last because in a certain way you've been playing for the future of art too early. I, I couldn't follow. In a certain way? I was saying that you've been uh, backing on the side of future, of the future of this profession, our coexistence for uh, a little bit too long, you know. And uh, the aspiration that um, Bijoy is talking about, the dependency that Bijoy is talking about, uh, you've discovered answers to this through your practice. So, um, I, I mean, the impetus for collaboration is clear, but uh, do you want to say something about how you think about the way forward and what lockdown has done to uh, your convictions about how we think about the present and future of uh, your practice and architecture more generally? I don't know. I think I'll, I'll answer the question, but uh, for me, the lockdown has been, uh, yeah, as uh, with respect to other offices and other friends who run architectural and allied type, uh, design practices, uh, the way they've been affected is, uh, I've been lucky that way, that uh, I, I have, uh, I'm used to going doing these ups and downs kind of a thing, but uh, I'll just trace back uh, to what uh, Vijay was addressing earlier mm. about the lack of infrastructure, the lack of humanism. Basically, it's just to be a simple human out there, like we just have to acknowledge that everybody has feelings. You know, the guy who, yeah. Like we don't even notice is there, and then it's been very simplistic about it. We have great grand budgets for our buildings, but we don't have budgets for the people who build it. You know, I think that's what Vijay has been lo looking for, or fighting for, or trying to figure out how to do it. Why isn't it? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of asking a lawyer here, why is it that a policy say, saying that if you're going to build this big building, I mean, Vijay uh, mentioned IIC, you know, so it's, I think it's affiliated to the government of, in a certain way. The, the government doesn't have a budget to take care of the people who are building for the government. I don't know. I, this is my basic question here. That's totally un understandable right because we have to realize that policy is not made for poor people <laughs> the forms of policy making are uh, too focused around uh, those who have control over policy making and, and i think that is where we we can differentiate between a developed way of thinking or a developed economy or whatever you call it mm -hmm. and a developing world yeah. But uh, Karun, can I invite you, I mean, almost uh, it's 9.33 now, but like, um, can I invite you to speak about the architectural element, the human element, I think both like um, uh, Varna and Bijoy have spoken about, but in, uh, because I really feel like... 
Art it is it caters to the human beings, no? It is human. I, I, I agree, but I'm saying, can you speak a little more about how you do that in your work and uh, an example of it, and then we can sort of wrap yeah, up. I would just echo what uh, Bijo is saying. It is that uh, maybe the way Bijoy's experiences are, the way he looks at it, and oh, his influences are, it's like, yeah, negotiations do influence the way the project happens. But at the same time, uh, with what Varna, I, I, I was kind of sad when Varna never considered herself to be before the architect, you know, or with the architect. I, I don't know why Varna can't put herself in a position and say like, hey, here I got a landscape project and these guys want to build something out there and which architect can I ask? Why, why, why is that always that, why is that hierarchy out there? And at the same time, one as a landscape architect after, be, after having that basic education of being an architect, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you did architecture and then became a landscape architect, right? You specialized to be a landscape architect, right? So, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so why is there this whole thing? So, so finally for me, just to answer your question in one last line, just to say yeah. that it is a team, man. Right? It's a team. I, I think I could break it down to a very simple thing of, let's say a football team, if one of the guys out of the 11 don't work, the project's not happening. The, your team is not going to score, score the goal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I think... Can I, can I yes, ask please. a question please. of Karun? Do we have any time? We do, so we Karun, do. you were saying that uh, you, know, you, you were on site and that you, you were actively sort of engaged in... Can you describe a little bit about how you work and, and what that structure okay, is like? Uh, okay, people... uh, th this is not my typical... Okay, we, I, we somehow, it is not by choice, but it, what comes your way in life. This particular site was... Uh, it, it was just about, uh, let's say, in meters, it was about seven meters below a road level. It is a hilly terrain uh, by Labdev in Uti. And this road was there, and the client bought it because he got it for a steal, basically. And then, uh, basically, you enter, it's a house, that's about it. You enter the house at the topmost floor. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then we had to get the foundation done and things like that. And you deal with many cultures. The client, it was very clear in that Hili Terran, the local population, um, how do you say, work culture was different as uh, opposed to what we had planned. Yeah. And uh, thanks, Bhadi. <clears throat> uh, I just uh, was, uh, what was uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, go for that. Uh, anyway. So basically, yeah, I, anyway, uh, whether it's okay. Uh, basically, what happened was uh, the client liked what we proposed. Uh, you can consider the image in the center. Yeah. Anyway, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the client what, uh, liked what he proposed, and he said, I don't know anybody who could build this for me. But because we did drawings that represented this whole thing. And it's a very steep slope. If you see the parking lot on the bottom right-hand side, is where you enter mm -hmm. the house. And the image on top of it is where it is, the bottommost part. The road is, uh, the road is on the second floor kind of a thing, you know? Not that, right. it's right on top. The road is uh, right, right, on, on. Uh, right on top of that. So uh, this man, uh, he told me to build it. If, if he, he liked it and he told me, can you build it for me? And then when I, then we accepted the offer and we built it for him. And basically we saw the culture of uh, uh, work, work out there and we saw it will take about five years to build this. So we devised a plan that the foundations, since we didn't figure out, technically we didn't figure out how to make a foundation uh, without, 
in a context where you can just go pin this whole building into the top and basically stay there. So you see this thing, this whole this whole building is pinned onto a certain uh, foundation. Uh, and the rest of the house, at least the structural part of the house, was built in Bangalore with very precise me uh, measurements. Yeah? And, and then we went and just capped the, the superstructure onto the foundation. But when you're doing the foundation, the, the, I think every, every architect knows when you start pouring concrete, you have to finish it in one stretch, you know? And we were being held hostage by the local population that they wanted to split a, a little earlier. So uh, I, I could share those images. Where we just said, whatever it is, you go if you want to. And then, you know, that's where the human thing came. There's another huge house that's being built on the right. Those people saw this hassle happening and they were all from Nepal. They said, kya ho raya saab, kya karega? <clears throat> I said, Aja give me a hand and when they saw me pouring concrete it ended up to be I, I still have brotherhood with them you know I still have brotherhood so it's just that that human element is necessary that especially we as architects who walk in and everybody will say Saab Agya you at least tell the maestri you know you can't tell everybody Teek hai kaisa hai and you know, if you, if you remember a few details about if he didn't come to work and all that, if he was falling sick, if he had fallen sick, he just said, Are you okay? Things like that, you know? And that makes a huge difference. It makes a bloody huge difference just to be human in doing so. And I think if I say that particular project that was shown, uh, it turned out that way because we ended up being a bunch of guys building it. That's about it. Like, I was sitting and having rotis, you know, you know, the carpenters who are doing the woodwork in the house, they have this whole system that they make three to four rotis, they put it in their hand and they put sabji on top of it, and then you, the, the last bit of sabji is so calculated, it goes to the last piece of roti and your hands are free. No, no plate on that. And when you sit and eat with them, they are willing. They are willing to walk in the. It is, uh, that that particular site is 2,300 meters above sea. It's cold. They are willing to walk down to the nearest shop to buy you a pack of cigarettes, man, without asking for it. That's all. You know, so uh, guys, I you know that I love conversation. I'm very happy to do this for three more hours at least. Uh, but some some humans need dinners and uh, other things. And I think that um, so like we heard this we heard this like expansive um, explanation by Karun where the humanism exists in the materiality, the construction, and the coexistence throughout. Right. So I just like to add one word: the jest. The gist. I think. No. Uh, in funny things or just as in the synopsis? Just, in, uh, just to say hello to people on, uh, <laughs> on site. Because the thing is, no, I, I, I'm sure the, the Bijoy and the. the uh, I, I, I'm not going to include Wagner. Because I don't know her line of work, but Bijay, when Bijay walks onto the site, I'm imagining, correct me if I'm wrong again, people go quiet, all, everybody's well behaved because. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, in terms of the labor thing, you know? I, I don't know if you even have contact because maybe the project is a scale which is you, nobody knows who is who kind of a thing. It, it could be that yeah. scale as well. But it's just that to say hi to a guy who makes eye contact to you on site changes because between them, you know, like we, you were talking about immigrant workers, right? But they, they yes. are those immigrant workers, man. Yeah. And they will be so happy that Saab ne mujhe hello kia. And I've, I've, I've been on the other side. 
That's all it takes. That's all it takes for your project to have lesser, your contractor to have lesser, uh, lesser, how do you say, HR problems. To put it that way. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this, I will, I mean, in the interest of uh, this tennis, like a couple of sentences each from Varna Bijoy uh, on, yeah, so where do we go from here? Say bye, reflect on this, whatever you like. Uh, yeah, so we'll start with uh, Varna and uh, then Bijoy and then perhaps we can say goodnight to everyone. Varna? Thanks so much, Badri, for inviting me to be a part of this session. And uh, I must actually thank Bijoy for all the opportunities he gives me. He and Sunita have been, um, you know, very constant with their encouragement. Um, so, and thank you so much, Karun, for, you know, having me part of this um, team, you know, in this discussion. And it's lovely to have Kingsley as well. So thank you so much, Badri, and wish you all the very best for your future conversations. Wish us all, wish us all the very best uh, for future conversations. And Bijoy, uh, um, not, not next no, thanks, Badri, for this conversation also, you know, uh, to stoke uh, our own, uh, I mean, to, to inspire us to think, uh, you know, things uh, a bit beyond our reach, maybe. Um, this uh, thing that uh, uh, Karun just mentioned reminded me of this Bangladeshi architect, a guy called Rafiq Azam. And apparently every time he has a project, uh, right at the start of the project, before they've sort of started digging on site, uh, he gets the client to take the whole team uh, to a fancy resort for a whole day. Uh, that is everybody from the bar benders to the electrical guys to you know the plumbers and the contractors and of course the clients and the consultants. And they have a nice time out in this uh, fancy place. They have meals, but as part of that, they also, all of the consultants get up and tell the group what this building is for, what it's about, what they're trying to achieve, so that everybody feels that they're part of that, you know, story. And that it isn't some higher up guy who's just coming and, you know, giving you information and then asking you to do the work. And, and Rafiq has had incredible success with his buildings in Bangladesh, achieving quality that I unheard of, you know, anywhere else. So and and he attributes it to this kind of generosity that every, every so often he gets people to engage as 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 the group that it is. So that makes complete and, sense. Yeah, it's a it's a great example. Yeah, it is a great example, and it's nice because like I've seen Karun embodying this now for like the last five years, and it's so nice. There's, it's just a nice way of living. But um, which I want to just say because it's not me inspiring you. There's a certain like. Uh, this is a negotiation as well, right? Like we're speaking to each other, learning of each other, and the aspiration is to get better. To like, I'm very grateful to all of you here and Kingsley as well, who's sat through this conversation so patiently and so generously um, to have this conversation. <laughs> and the second thing I want to say, Vijay, just in the spirit of what you were saying, the I think the the coming together of intentions is far more important than the coming together of labor. Because labor is only physical labor, but intention can manifest as emotional labor, spiritual labor, um, generosity, and other kinds of things. Right? If you look at our action as a vector as opposed to a scalar force, you realize that hmm. combining intentions is far more valuable than combining labor for its own sake. So um, it makes complete sense that Rafiq has found the kind of success that he has, you know, um, that it, it, it clearly is consistent with uh, aspiration with conversations like this. You know, how can we learn from each other and uh, inspire us and each other to be uh, better humans? You know, I don't know why we try to be like machines uh, when we have the, the capacity to like love and evolve and all of those things. But uh, with that, at least we will end the live stream. And, and uh, yeah, and thank you all for joining us here. We're a little over time today, but like everyone wanted to be on it, so I'm not uh, going thank to. Thank you, Kingsley. Yeah, thank you. Kingsley. Uh, Thanks. Thank you for reaching us for that. Uh, and uh, uh, Badri, I want to say something. Yes, please, please, Kingsley. Yeah, to all, and you know, I, I got a lot of ideas and uh, the inspired and my knowledge. I would like to visit to Bangalore. 
welcome anytime see your art and your art of architecture it's 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 very very uh, important for me i think it's i love that it's it's a nice discussion and i i think i am a good listener because i i, I think i, I spend uh, all the time to listen that uh, you uh, something it's it's something which uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand that you are your architecture language but it's it's interesting for me to i inspired some some of uh, some something uh, you said and varna Kar karun and uh, bijoy and badri thank you very much oh, i mean oh. it's very kind of you guys yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh,